So summon her back from her moon place. That's too. That's interesting too. Like when she went, when when she disappeared, I thought she was gonna make her move a little more pronounced, but she kind of, I guess, was waiting for you to, to hold up your end of the bargain. Yeah. This is the second most curious ending to me. That's my girl. Yeah, that's my girl. Yeah. Live free and die. Wifey ending. Trophy unlocked. By God, these bitches gay. <laughs> Good for them. Good for them. Platinum trophy. The battle is over, I see. Still got to put the head back on. Yo. Hug me with those forearms. I wonder if she wants a new body. She seems to not care very much. Hated the old one. I do solemnly swear. To every living being and every living soul. Now cometh the age of the stars. A thousand year voyage under the wisdom of the moon. Ooh. Here beginneth the chill night that encompasses all, reaching the great beyond. Wow. Into fear, doubt, and loneliness. As the path stretcheth into darkness. No gods, no kings, only silence. Let us go together. But secretly there is a god. It's just not talking to you because it wants you to make up your own mind. My dear consort eternal. <laughs> Yo, Reggie. You yeah. four armpits? <laughs> Ukwa. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Ukwa. No. Oh. Jesus. <laughs> I'm not even going to hit the team. Oh You're getting God. hype. You're getting hype. I mean, that would be my ending, sure. But, you know, I'm serving. <laughs> I'm serving. Four! What are you gonna do me like that? <laughs> Man. Shit. It's not like I'm gonna audibly say no. You know? Fuck. <laughs> Four. <laughs> Very respectable outcome as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Doubt and confusion will definitely frustrate people indefinitely but the idea being that me telling you what to do is worse ooh new theme yeah the idea that me telling you what to do uh, is is so is so much worse than you making your own path so I'm here, but let me not influence it, right? I guess we have Your to... Your own path, yeah, I like it. We do have to infer from her words, too, that, like, what would it take for her to intervene, right? Um, reality at risk, an outer god or something threatening 
to destroy all things, right? There's a level you have to assume where Rani's silence would be broken if something was detrimental enough. You know, you want your people to live free. So your whole MO is giving them the choice. But at some point, if there's a disruption to that, I'm sure she would step in. To make sure that they remain free? So that they may remain free, exactly. If something would threaten their existence or the order of their freedom, then, it, then her job would be to step in to do that. Ideally. You know? So, yeah. But to you who lives in that world, you would just be like, they gods forsook us, bad end. Once yeah. upon a time, you know, once upon a time, we could walk over to that tree and pick from it and God would be like, hey, yeah, what's up? That's my tree. But no more. Then y'all started fucking asking questions. <laughs> Digging deep. And then you felt shameful about doing it doggy style. <laughs> <laughs> and God said, get out! We're missionaries, missionaries only. Alright, we're missionaries, not dogs. <laughs> so, Garden of Eden, eternal life, but no reverse cowgirl? <laughs> I'm out! <laughs> Deuces! <laughs> What a cloud. <laughs> Smash the phone on the ground, break the skateboard. No head? Ah! Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh. Cool, cool. Different theme. Boom. All right. One more time. <laughs> so that was... Two out of five? Uh, that is the second one. Sweet. Um, download Elden Ring to console. 445 to replace 509. Rewind. Using that needle in Faru Mazula. Mm -hmm. It's funny because, well, depending on the game, sometimes just picking the ending you want uh, uh, might not be the best way to do it. But I, 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 in these can in these cases or in the Sekiro contrivance case, I much prefer this. Alright, which one? Poop. Ooh. May shit take the world. May shit take the world. Just everyone clutching their stomachs. Ooh. Like, oh, oh, oh. Ooh, I'm all shit. The brown order. Maroon order. Blood and scat. Oh, God. <laughs> blood and scat. Blood and So, scat. blood flame, ice lightning, blood shit. <laughs> blood shit. It's time. <laughs> it's time. It all returns to shit anyway. Everyone's like, no. And Caleb is like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're ready. Give it, give it, give it, give it, give it. Use the hammer to forge a glass table. <laughs> Is that where you want to drop it? Is that where you want to drop it? Please. <laughs> of how a tarnished became Elden Lord. Oh my god, look at the sky. Yeah. Her home, 
across the fog, the lands between. Are those shit clouds? That's a poop sky. <laughs> a seed will look back upon us and recall. The reviled curse that defined our age. The blessing of despair. Bow before the poo poo. <laughs> Ugh, shit sky is bad. It's not good. Every day you wake up and see shit. <laughs> oh. Shit storm. 20 centimeters oh. around your house. Fucking shovel that shit. It never stops smelling. Never. Ever. You get used to it, right? We have to, you have to become Volus. <laughs> Ooh, hardcore Voluses. And a theme for this ending too. Not just the sound of farts. For yeah, like, I'm waiting for horns to like. Ah, <laughs> 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 oh, there. Well, there actually. That's the that's the the little violin type theme that played. I feel like walking into dung territory. Yeah, yeah. There it is. <laughs> Oh no! Your stomach's getting excited. <laughs> <laughs> Grab the walls. Ah! All over the Dunkin' Donuts. It's the stall. brown note. <laughs> All over uh, the horrible, walls. Horrible, 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 terrible. God, no. <laughs> Jesus. Oof. All right, next. Chaos is so much more preferable to just guaranteed shit. You know? Because <laughs> chaos is like, sometimes you're going to get some shit, but sometimes you're not. <laughs> it's chaos. But when you get the shit, you get it 100% yeah. of chaos the time. Chaos incorporates all things good and bad. You know? Sunny with a chance of poop, but <laughs> not all poop all the time. <laughs> All right. <laughs> download to console storage. Elden Ring. Download the 445. Overwrite the save on console, and we're good. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah, I guess there's no way to go back and pop chaos. Now that it's been I don't think removed. So. I think we might have to. Um, so the choice would have been to do it right at the end. If I didn't walk in. To go down there now. And. Uh, so it just has information? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We can watch it. But if I didn't go do it out of curiosity. Then I imagine right now you could have just walked down there. And gotten it. Uh, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to you have to put her back together. No rest. No oh, rest for America. Yeah. Ah, if you have the frenzy flame, you can't use any other choices anyway. Right. Right. Yep. So then we would have gone okay. And cleaned ourselves. So in Fia's name. For the Prince of Death. And for all those who live in death. Mm. 
Shout out to Rogier. He tried. Yep. You can see the mark. All the runes together. I wonder why it became a tree. Of all the things it could become. Good question. The fallen leaves tell It's visually story. incredibly interesting. Just for a world of with a giant tree in the middle of it. But. Became Elden Lord. In our home, across the fog, the lands between. Fog and well, death. Look back upon us and recall the age of the Duskborn. Hmm. Duskborn. I mean, dust remind me of only one thing. Mm -hmm. Like the Gloam slash Dust Eyed Queen. Time to rename this capital Lane Dell. I call it London. <laughs> <laughs> That would actually be an upgrade from London. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking fog everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Everybody respect death. Don't be mean to the zombies. Except for the ones who want to die. Then, you know. Yeah. Give it to them. Use, it all. use your ruin and, and, and use destined death to put them out of their misery if possible. Uh, and then it's going into the theme. Okay. Not bad. All right. I'm going to go ahead and assume that generic is just sitting down and not, really, not really thinking about anything. <laughs> I don't know. I want to be a lord, I guess. Damn. I really wish. I really wish we had more chance to talk to Nefeli. You know. I agree. I like her, and uh, I like <laughs> like that lineage. <laughs> like holy crap! I mean, if I didn't build like a fucking barbarian punch mage lady like nefeli would be the spirit of what i want in this game anyway so yeah totally agreed and the idea of like her being on a big old orderly castle throne it's like well hoara did the same you know so it's not out of place mm. but hopefully um she won't be shit about it. Also, she needs a beast. She had a, she had a hawk. We gave her a hawk. Yeah, she I remembers guess that, the hawk from her childhood. I yeah. guess the hawk would be her her vassal. Uh, and so, the basic bitch ending. The I went straight to the end ending. <laughs> Head empty. That's me. Speedrunner's ending. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, frankly, you can just skip all this and just make it a Samus posing artwork cutscene with your time and percentage <laughs> clear. <laughs> like, cut the pop and circumstance. That's not why you're here. 
If you were, you won't be. You wouldn't be choosing this ending. It's interesting though, like all this this platform, this zone, and final like area, are reminding me of. Um, uh, mortal shell. The fallen leaves. In texture and color. Tell a story. Of how a tarnished became Elden Lord. Cold skies. In our home. Across the fog. The lands between. Our seed will look back upon us and recall an age of fracture. Or will they? Who knows? It's an age of fucking nothing. More of the same. Same sky. Same shit. Bye, Ranny. By who? yeah, just by who? <laughs> Reset button. Just control Z for about an hour. Just keep undoing. Okay, we're good. Now me, I'm king. Okay, and that would be that. Man, that would be weak. Yeah, link <laughs> link the fire. That would be weak. That would be pretty weak indeed. Okay, so. Um, good theme though. Good ass theme. I am. Yeah, I'm going. I'm going perfect order. Yep, that's the one. I'm going perfect order. So, tell them. Uh, let me just reset this, and then let's go see a video of the chaos ending. Oh, let's go. Oh, who's high for chaos? May chaos take the world! <laughs> chaos, chaos. Uh, yeah, just reset it one more time. I know I saw people playing as Shrek in this game. Can oh we get God, Shadow mods. of the Hedgehog in there? Yeah. Yeah. Give me Shadow Hedgehog <laughs> being the Chaos Lord. That's what I want. Shabriri loves it. <laughs> All right. So let's go set that up. Okay. So this is the frenzied flame ending. Okay. Oh, my. No prompt. You just fucking fall. Huh. Damn. Oh, Ghost Rider. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. That's kind of sick. Oh shit. Oh, that's good fire. <laughs> no throne, no rebuild, no reforge. Just chaos. Just burn it all. Burn it all. Return it all to one. Yep. 
The one great. Oh, <laughs> shit! Oh, it split apart! Uh, 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 <laughs> Letting me down, letting me down, letting me down. <laughs> Woo! No words. No <laughs> words needed. Crisped. No words. It all returns to nothing. Yeah. That is interesting because the implications, of course, are that you you just don't get uh Yeah, there's no rebuilding of America. You just fucking take it all down. Yep. Interesting. Then okay. we'll truly be united. It's the most different of them so far, for sure. Right? That's very different. Um, and so there's a post credit scene as well. So let's take a look at that. Chaos ring. Lord of frenzied flame. I will seek you as far as you may travel. To deliver you what is yours. Because you destined death. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Because you spared her by choosing that route, and she really begged you not to do that. So, even if you did what Shabriri said in her name, she's not too excited by that prospect. You leave behind a chaos ring, interestingly. The world is chaos, but within that, she's still around and she can come get that and then come find you and take you out. Because that's how you kill a god, right? Are you seeing what's pouring in? That's Torrent's ring? Oh. Oh, what? Oh, my bad. Yeah, I'm surprised by that one. I did not think of that. We haven't looked at the item for Torrent Summoning since we got it 1,000 hours ago. Can you do a quick control F on that? I don't think that that will come. I don't think we wrote about it. Torrent of Horror. That ring on the ground Special was... Special Steed Whistle. I do not have the info on that one. Okay. Let's Let me look it up. Yeah. Um. So that's what that's what uh, Rani... Oh, no, that's what she gave us to summon Torrent in the beginning. Mm-hmm. A delicate gold work ring can be used as a finger whistle. Sound the whistle to summon and ride Torrent the Spectral Steed. Upon his death, the Spectral Steed can be summoned again, but doing so drains the Flask of Crimson Tears. That is all we have as a description. Ah. Okay. Hmm. Okay, then I'm not too sure what to make of it. 
other than you and your failure to take care of him. And then her coming for you afterwards. Um, if you burned everything, then you must have burned Torrent too. Yeah. Okay. Was that a byproduct of everything being taken by chaos? Or was that a specific thing that you did there? You know, is it just everything burned and as a result, torrent too? And so she came around and went like, motherfucker, I told you to take care of that horse. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And there's a theory that she's the glomide queen because of that, because of that cutscene and her eye. Is that canon? Is that backed up? Is that, is that Fanon? What's the, what's the takeaway on that? Hard maybes? I don't know about that. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, if you're talking, if you're talking about eye stuff, uh, maybe, maybe, I don't know. Uh, it doesn't seem like we're getting much uh lock in on the glomide queen to begin with but you know again dlc this is the point in time where dlc can come along and straighten a few things out in the form of outer gods uh any reason here blow 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 us up reggie anytime there's a moment like this where i ramble and i say nonsense and then you come in and you drop a bomb i, I don't let's know, hear I don't it know. I, I don't have a bomb let's right hear now. a bomb i just wanted to, to you ha- this is the, this is the time why did Rani, aka Rena, the first time we saw her, ask us if we could call Torrent? Um, why did she ask if we could? Yeah. Perhaps to verify that we had been spoken to by Melina and that we have uh, a maiden. Why why would she why would she know that? Why would she know that we have Torrent? What's what's yeah. the what's the first conversation? Because again, it's the beginning of the game. I don't remember. Oh, the very very first conversation. What are you making reference to? Um, oh, I touched something. Just a second. <laughs> I touched some buttons here. All right. So the first time, what did you search for? Torrent. Torrent. The mm-hmm. first time he smells us, mm-hmm. and then a lady says that our kind is sure to seek the Elden Ring. I believe that was. We didn't know who that was at the time, but that was a, vo- a random voice says that, that was that was Melina. We were on the floor, I think, when we got out of the chapel. Okay, and then Torrent he comes, he smells our pants, and then we get, "I am Melina. I am your level up lady." Yeah, blah 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 blah. She says to take to her to the foot of the earth tree. Mm-hmm. And then you get, she gives us the spectral steed whistle. Mm-hmm. Uh, then Rena, we see her, which Rena, and he, she asks if we can call Torrent. It's a gift from Torrent's former master. No, 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 that's not it. What? What is a gift? Okay, I'm not sure because of the the way I wrote it down, but I said. Which Rena asks if we can call Torrent, gift from T's forward master. Oh, the spirit calling bell is a gift from Torrent's former master. Okay. Huh. And that was that allows the summons, right? Uh, the spirit calling bell calls spirit, I think. That's the what... spectral whis- steed whistle calls Torrent. Yes, but r- r- we, meet Mel- we meet Melina, she gives us the torrent summoner uh-huh. and then we meet ratty and she gives us the, the spirit, spirit summoner bell. and then we can call in the wolves uh-huh um what is the connection that you're drawing well if this is torrent's ring that we picked up at the end then at the very beginning of the game when they were like oh this this should go to you how did they know Rani? Um, so, sorry, can you explain a little better what you mean? Uh, I'm not 100% following. When Torrance when Torrent smelled us, mm-hmm. the lady, Melina, is said that Arkhan is sure to seek the Elden Ring. Mm-hmm. 
and then she gave us the summon thing, right? She gave us the way to call Melina. Yes. And then she's at the end and she picks up the same thing again that she gave us. Yes. So I'm but what but, but what's the Rani I'm, part? Uh Rena Rani when she saw us when she saw us she asks us can you call torrent mm-hmm. so I'm like why did she ask that I don't know okay that's the only thing sorry I'm that's that's the part that I'm kind of focused on I'm yeah. like what do you think the an- are, are you I asking absolutely don't know okay okay but you just wrote down that she asks yeah, if we the can witch call Rena torrent. asks if we can call torrent and then we say yes okay. Um, I mean, we, I, I feel like what we know about Melina is that she offers to be your maiden because you're maidenless. And, um, there's the part where, uh, I thought about her and Rani being connected because of the, the, the two, the second, the, the eyes. Yeah. At first. Yeah. And the overlap on the eyes. But we never said that was a thing, right? We just, hinted I just, at I it, just looked but... at it. I remember in the trailer, we saw the eye overlap on her left side. Yeah. And then on the right side. And then we looked and said, like, is that second face supposed to be like a, a, a linking between the two of some kind? But, um, we never got anything yeah. further hard confirming that. So as far as that goes, I, just, I don't know. I kind of left that up in the air. Um, her asking if you can summon Torrent, um, it means she knows who Torrent is. So, you know. Yeah, they both know who Torrent is. Right. right. Um, now, if, if Torrent's former master was Melina. They both know Torrent's former master, in a way. Well, they, they both, they both know Torrent and, and, if, if it's her herself that like had torrent beforehand then um either way i would assume that rani probably knows who melina is right there's no reason to assume she wouldn't know if she if if she knows torrent so that's i think that's all we can really infer from that is that they know each other okay and then beyond them knowing each other, because they both know Torrent, there's the the eye theory, but yeah. that's just up in the air. There's yeah. no hard conf- confirmation on that. Uh, yeah, I I just saw these two things and I just wanted to like show you like, hey, what about this? You know, mm-hmm. I don't know what to mm-hmm. to take out from this, but all I seem to understand is that both Rani and so, Melina knew Torrent. Okay. Somehow. Or at so, least a former master. Let's dodge a stud lock. Yeah. I pulled up her dialogue. Um, when you meet her at the church, she says, This way, Tarnished, may I have a word? A pleasure to meet thee, Tarnished. I'm the witch Rena, which is, of course, like a fake name. Uh-huh. She's, that's her mom's name, right? When she says Rena, I'm assuming she's just doing like short for Renala. Renala? Even with the, the rise there? But I, but I think Rena's rise is also is Renala's okay, rise. I, I, think there, I think Rena is just a short okay. for Renala. All right. And she's taking that as her, as her mom's name okay. uh, cover type of thing. Um, if that's not the case, then um, is Rena the Snow Witch then? Did they? Okay. If Rena is the Snow Witch, then that, that also. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. What uh, the item descriptions about the Snow Witch, I remember they just, I don't remember them saying that she was. I just remember they describing a Snow Witch. What did, did, uh, did we get a hard confirmation that that's who Rena is? Uh, when you look at the Snow Witch set, it says, worn by the Snowy Crone, who their young Rani encountered in the woods, a cold witch. Rani's secret mentor. The doll housing Rani's soul is modeled after her. So Rena might be the name of the witch. Unless I'm mistaken. Read that last part again. Uh, sure. Rena's rise was unlocked. The snow witch set was picked up. Worn by a snowy crone who the young Rani encountered in the woods. Cold witch. Rani's secret mentor. And it's found in Rena's Rise. So, okay. So there's a possibility that that's who that, that's her name then. Okay. <sighs> Boy. 
boy, that name game stuff is so, so, so weird. <laughs> this way. No, this way. <laughs> well, because I, w- when we walked away from that area and it wasn't, there wasn't anyone named Rena explicitly that we could like directly confirm 100%. I kind of went like, well, Rena is the beginning of the word Renala, and it's her mother. So I kind of went, oh, is that just like a nickname? Mm-hmm. Like Rena, it's like, a, you know what I mean? Like, I, I kind of just went like, oh, they must be making reference to Renala with the word Rena. I see. Um, you know, not even a Morgot, Morgot, Margot situation. <laughs> but the idea of there being Rani, Rena, Renala. And like Renala is Rani's daughter, or Renala is Rani's Rani's mom. Rena is another person, unrelated, that is a Snow Witch, that is not her. It's like okay, well, shit. <laughs> that's not that, that that's not the most straightforward Occam's razor on it. Okay, cool. Um, right, let's move on. Yep, because this is where we get into the yep. Uh, heard a tell of a tarnished hurling, hurling atop a spectre. Okay. I am the witch Rena. I heard tell of a tarnished hurling about atop a spectral seed, steed. And upon looking into the matter, the talk, I surmise, is of thee. Thou art possessed, no, of the power to call forth a spectral steed named Torrent. Okay. Yes or no? I heard, I heard tell that a tarnished was riding a spectral steed. You're the one you can call torrent. Okay. Yes. As I'd hoped I entrusted, I was entrusted this for you by torrent's former master. It's a bell for calling forth spirits. Mm -hmm. Summon them with it. Okay. Um, we don't know who for the former master was. We don't know, um, why they entrusted it through Rena, but, if it was something that Rani is right. But like if, but like Melina would have given it to you at the same time, if like she was Torrent's former master or so. Right. So question marks. Um, and then summon it, summon, um, Ash on return to the earth tree spirits obey, obey your commands, but briefly. And then she explains that mechanic, uh, forgive my intrusion. I doubt we'll meet again. Yeah. Bullshit. There you go. Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. I think we're I think we're okay just putting things out there and going like I mean and this is ultimately this is the 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 big say on it is like we're okay putting things out there and going like this is a hard maybe, right? But like we get very like stun locked when it seems like you guys have a hard answer for something. That is like, no, that's wrong. It's actually this. But it's like, if it's still speculation, please keep it. Please speak that way. Because it's all, if we're still speculating about something, then it's not hard confirmed, right? So let's keep it, you know, up to debate if it's not actually locked in. Because then we get like, wait, is it hard locked in? And then now we're going the other way on it, trying to chase down hard proof of something that's not in fact proven, right? Um, Okay, so with that being said, uh, I like... The idea of trying to see if there's, based on what we haven't seen in the game, if there's enough to answer some of the questions we still have. And the number one place to go for this, of course, is Vatividia, who has been the lore master extreme okay. on this. Not to mention, of course, our good friend, German Spy. Hello. Oh, <laughs> Out there up? as well. But uh, Oh, he's talking to you. Yeah, Spy is... Spy is... Uh, Close to the, the the making of the sausage. Hold on a minute. Spy says, Rani is Rena. It's a pseudonym she uses. Yep. Yes. She tells you so herself when you first meet her. The exact line is, okay, again, we, cr- okay. Oh, again, we cross paths. I believe I said my name was Rena yep. when we last met. Yes. Uh, I do remember that it was a pseudonym she used to like uh, as a second name. What I was thinking was that she was using a fake name her real name is rani yeah and that rena is actually someone else that's how i took it that she was pretending to use that name that's my uh thing i i that's how i took it yeah 
if Rena is nobody and it was just her fake name, then uh, that would be all the more confusing, especially considering there's two rises, you know? So Mm-mm-mm. that's how I took it too. Yeah, the same way. Okay. So let's check out what uh, we've got here in the form of the Vati video videos, because these are the things that I've been uh, very much looking forward to seeing um, while we've been playing. A lot of the time they come along and they give you some really great context for... Um, oh, didn't we watch one at the end of Dark Souls? Or did we just talk we about watched Plague of Gripes. <laughs> we, wa- we, did, we watched the Plague of Gripes video. <laughs> yeah, did yeah, yeah, yeah. Did he do one for all the videos? Did he do one for all the videos? She's my terrified. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Okay. Well, Gurier. not... rear. <laughs> well, uh... The, uh, the, um, my, my Kirby lore videos and like, welcome to, uh, prepare to hi and all that, that junk is like parody of this style of, of lore <laughs> delivery, see. uh, which should be made obvious. So we've got three videos here and, um, I figure let's check them out and see, uh, if this answers some of the questions, because I know for sure that there are pieces we didn't pick up that are. Yeah gonna come together in a much more coherent way if you've got the full perspective so the first video is elden ring's lore explained by vati video the story doesn't begin in the lands between it begins in the cosmos far away with an outer god called the greater will there are A lot of outer gods mentioned in Elden Ring. You can think of these kind of like the Great Ones of Bloodborne. They're distant beings, they're all powerful, and they're quite unknowable by design. But many- Whoops. (laughs) Should I leave? I legit went in my head, what the fuck is- Oh, I should not be watching this. When I made the decision to take a look at Bloodborne uh, re- re- remake PSX, it was like, well, it's just the first level. Yeah, it's just It'll the be a right? fun little tease. It'll that be fine. That seems pretty final. It's fine. It's fine. It's actually not a big deal. It's cool. And it's not. I can still enjoy games. It's, it's not final. Yes, that's cool. All but right. I hope that a lot of this is self-contained. That's good. <laughs> That's good. I hope we can continue in a self-contained manner. It's fine. Uh, you're coming at this shit like... <laughs> what the fuck you expect, nigga? I'm sorry. Damn. Too bad. <laughs> Too bad. All right, All right. Let's go. Let's go. It's your fault. It's my fault. I agree. Many of these outer gods want to make their presence felt <laughs> in the world. The greater will may be most of all. To this end, it sent a golden star hurtling towards the lands between. The Elden Star's incantation tells us that this golden star was bearing a beast, an Elden beast. The Elden Remembrance calls it a vassal beast of the greater will. If you didn't know, a vassal is someone who holds land on behalf of their overlord. Obviously, this is fitting in this case, because the Elden Beast occupied the lands between on behalf of the greater will, and was a living incarnation of the concept of order. As such, this beast would later become the Elden Ring. The Elden Ring itself is made up of runes of power, some great, some small, that together represent a sort of logic for the world to follow. Thus, the Elden Ring represents order. The true nature of this order is a subject of constant debate and research undergone by fundamentalists. But two of the key fundamentals are the laws of causality and regression. You can think of the law of causality as cause and effect, where actions have consequences, and those consequences are new causes that branch out into infinity. These are the relationships between things. Then there's the law of regression that states that all things eternally yearn to converge and return to their roots. Fittingly, then, the Elden Ring is housed within the Erd Tree, which towers over the lands between. 
But it's very important to stress that life in the Lands Between did not begin with the Erd Tree, the Elden Ring, or the Elden Beast. No, the Lands Between were occupied well before the Greater Will came. There were other beings here. There were other factions here. Mm -hmm. There were other gods here. Mm -hmm. And there was even another great tree here before the Erd Tree. And this is where a huge twist regarding the Erd Tree comes in. So there are incantations in the game called Aspects of the Crucible. According to their descriptions, these are manifestations of the Erd Tree's primal, primal. vital energies. Yep. And I quote, they are an aspect of the primordial crucible where all life was once blended together. But how could all life be blended together in the Erd Tree if the Erd Tree appeared after life existed? Exactly. Well, there can only be one answer, right? That the Erd Tree is a parasite, and it took over a tree that existed here before. This ancient tree was called the Great Tree. So the Great Tree was almost certainly the location of this primordial crucible, and it must have been a very powerful primordial force for the Greater What did that say back there? It's cut off because of the speaker. Oh, there's a lot of stuff being displayed, like, just... Oh, it's like, oh, Silurias, Crucible, Knight, something, something, Helm. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, all right, it's just, it's... Real crucible. It's actually cropped. It must have been a very powerful primordial force for the Greater Will to have commandeered might even be the reason the Lands Between is important to the Greater Will in the first place. It also explains why spells and enemies related to the Great Tree's Crucible would eventually be looked down upon. For example, the Knot Talisman is fashioned from a knotted vestige of the Crucible. Okay, yes, everyone's saying that this, this some of this stuff gets corrected in the next videos. The term Parasite was corrected later on? We hear you. We will, we will watch through and see the others and see what gets corrected. Okay and it was considered a signifier of the divine in ancient times, but is now increasingly disdained as an impurity as civilization has advanced. Enemies related to the Crucible are the Omen, the Misbegotten, and the Crucible Knights, and all three of them would be shunned, enslaved, or imprisoned. Those who speak for the Erd Tree don't want you to know its roots, so to speak. According to the spell, protection of the Erd Tree, in the beginning everything was in opposition to the Erd Tree, but through countless victories in war, it became the embodiment of order. Mm. In Marika's own words, the Erd Tree governs all. The choice is thine. Become one with the order, or divest thyself of it. To wallow at the fringes, a powerless upstart. But the Greater Will needed more than a big tree, it needed loyal agents in the Lands Between. To this end, it has the Two Fingers, who are its envoys. The Two Fingers heirloom has a weird picture of them, but it reads, of course... Okay, we're just gonna not be able to read what's below okay. because of the, the full screen crop yeah. and the speaker in the way, unfortunately. By the way, does that mean that the tree on the Crucible Knight is not the Earth Tree, but actually the Great Tree? From beforehand. From beforehand. That's what, the, that's what, he that's said, what right? he's implying. Okay, yeah, cool. And that makes a whole lot of sense as to why it's like, shh, shh, the fuck up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. New order, new order. <laughs> right? And we talk about like, wait, but there's dragons beforehand and there's all kinds of shit beforehand. And there's a whole lot of talk about pre earth tree. And it's like, how the fuck does that make any sense? And it's like, well, because there absolutely was a tree beforehand, mm -hmm. but they're just taking it over as opposed to, you know, building a new thing. That is, uh, if so, if that speculation is 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 accurate, then um, it stand it explains a lot of yeah why there's a whole lot of shove it under the carpet going on, Sh literally shove it under the capital, curse them, fuck them yeah. over, don't we don't talk about them, don't look beast misbegotten in the eyes, don't shake omen hands, <laughs> crucible knights run the other way, mm -hmm. stick them in Noxtella. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it feels as if a lot of that is uh, like, yeah, we got a new religion. We got a new order. Stop talking about the old shit. Yeah. Fingers cannot speak, yet these are eloquent. Persistently, they wriggle, spelling out mysteries in the air. Thus did we gain the words, the words of our faith. Which is how, which is what fucking Gold Mask, Gold Mask is doing. Read, yeah. He's doing the finger things, which is how they, we interpret what they're saying. Right. These 
words are interpreted by the finger readers. These are the undying old crones that you would have found throughout the lands between. They pass down the wisdom of the two fingers, or at least they used to. Your fingers, please, your fingers. I can read them. Most of them appear to have lost their purpose, and they're desperate to read your fingers and tell you annoying riddles, since their two fingers are likely dead. And yes, of course, there are multiple sets of two fingers. You would have found their corpses on the tops of the divine mm -hmm. towers. Atop these towers, you loot the fingers in order to activate the true power of a great rune. Specifically though, you are giving benediction back to your great rune. You're taking a blessing back from the two dead fingers, essentially. This is just one of many blessings that the two fingers can bestow, and my point is kind of that the two fingers clearly have more than just influence. They have real power. I think it's just saying source and then okay. the descriptions for what he's saying. Um, let, me, let me just verify that. See, also, Rhino goes to great length to slay our own two fingers. Oh, what a bad place to put a little... <laughs> like, at the bottom, it's, bottom, it's, bottom. it's Yeah, it's, it's covered over by the, the control thing. We wouldn't allow that in a video game. Yeah. There's a certain area around the video where no. you're not supposed to put stuff. Uh, safe, <laughs> safe bounding areas. Yep. Uh, the, there's a, it goes outside of that, uh, indeed. But I think... Yeah, it's, uh, the, the bottom text is just sources for what he's saying. Okay. No problem. We can live without that. I trust. Two fingers clearly have more than just influence. They have real power on some level. The Greater Will needs these powerful envoys and agents because while it's obviously incredibly powerful, it does seem limited by a few things. First is space. The Greater Will didn't come to the lands between itself. It sent an elden beast to do its bidding instead. Why? Well, I can... Well, that head is very fingery. Now that you put them next to each other. Anyway. Second <laughs> is time. There is a moment later in the game where your pair of two fingers go still because they're forced to commune with the greater will for guidance. When they are finished, the fingers will again offer their guidance. But thousands, if not tens of thousands, of moons must first pass. No matter for me, but you. How will you ever manage to wait? So the Greater Will needs a physical manifestation of order. It needs envoys to convey its will, but what it also needs is a god. Introducing Marika the Eternal. I have this utterly oh, enormous mind map fuck. of Elden Ring's lore, oh, and what? there's a reason she's at the center. She's essentially the equivalent of Gwyn from Why would Dark you show Souls, us that? Except, okay. Why would you show us that? <laughs> to be fair? This is his job. Oh my god. <laughs> to be fair, this is literally his job. Gold mask, tell me the result. Don't tell me the calculations. <laughs> Just Your purpose uh, like <laughs> is dedicated to understanding this shit. Oh You're god. gonna put one of those together. Right. Yeah. <laughs> REG system system in shambles. Oh my god, replaced. <laughs> Shattered. <laughs> With a fucking hammer. <laughs> Bing! <laughs> Bing! The shattering of REG. Holy oh my shit. God, okay. Unlike Gwyn, Marika didn't just crawl out of the dark and find power. To an extent, it seems like she earned it. We don't know much about her origins, except that she is of the Newman race, which is actually an origin that you can choose mm -hmm. in the character selection screen. Newman come from outside the lands between, and are supposed descendants of denizens of another world, long lived but seldom born. At some point, Marika was chosen as an Empyrean. What is an Empyrean? Well, an Empyrean is a being chosen by the Fingers as a candidate for godhood. As an Empyrean, Marika received the aid of a shadow to do her bidding. So what is a shadow? Well, it's a wolf, shadow bound to its Empyrean by the two fingers. A wolf. Luna Princess a wolf. Rani is another example of an Empyrean with a shadow bound beast. You would have met Blythe. These creatures are the Empyrean's very own shadow. They are completely loyal to their needs and, by definition, incapable of treachery. Marika's shadow was a beast called Malaketh. 
Every Empyrean uses their shadow in different ways, but Marika's sole need of her shadow was as a vessel to lock away destined death. So what is destined death? Betrayed. According to Enya, it's the rune of death. The rune of death goes by two names. The other is destined death. We mentioned earlier that the Elden Ring is made up of runes, and at some point, maybe when she was chosen as a god, Marika plucked the Rune of Death from the Elden Ring. She gave the Rune of Death to Malekith, her totally loyal shadow, who bore a black blade imbued with this rune. It's kind of genius, really. In a single act, she removed the concept of death from the lands between, while also <sighs> commanding total control of death through her shadow, who could deliver it at her whim. Control. Okay, 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 okay. Control over it. Now, by taking it out of the ring itself... See, this is, I guess, where I get a little bit confused. More than a little bit. A whole lot confused. Each rune represents a law that comes together to create a governing system, as he said, right? So, the Elden Ring itself, uh, when it breaks... That means the laws break. That means that systems are no longer working and order has been destroyed because the very concept of order is the ring, is the yeah, Elden Beast. the order beast. is everything, not just everything The Elden Beast this. itself and the ring itself, the Elden Beast itself, which is the ring, as given by the greater will, is the concept of order, given form. And so when you destroy that, you destroy that, that order. Now... The idea of, and then the shattering leads to all these different runes, which then get distributed among the demigods. The idea that you pick one up and or separate it and beforehand, and I guess before the shattering even, she's picking one out of it and giving it to Malekith. Uh -huh. So the ring, the ring is continuing to function despite one of the orders of its, one of the laws of its order being removed, you know? Um... I'm, and, I, and I'm kind of like, I guess I'm just like, oh, you can do that? You can pull one out without We're learning. destroying the whole thing? Yeah. And furthermore, when you destroy the ring, you destroy what's binding them together. But the individual runes, as you see, um, can function on their own, mm. you know? And then the mending rune will pull it all back together again. But these individual components function fine if you just hold on to one of them. You know, so it's kind of like, I guess I'm just, well, I'm like, yeah, like, what's, and it, well, anyway, let's oh, keep watching. And when you mend it, you're adding your own extra in it, basically? Uh, you're mending it in whatever fashion. Maybe, I don't know if you're adding your own to it, or I don't know if you're rearranging it. Like, if you're doing it, like, for. But your will, or whatever purpose you've chosen is affecting the rearrangement, yeah. right? It might be literally taking the same Lego pieces and putting them back into a different shape, or it might be putting your own thing into it. But it's definitely, there's different- it's a new rule. There's different added, ways yeah. to mend it. There's okay. different ways to get to the right equation. If you, whether, whether you go by one, like under like, you know, do it for Rani, do it under perfect law, do it this way or that way. It seems as if like, yeah, you are taking those same components, but like, combining back uh, a unique version of it but i guess i'm just like yeah so then why you will have to get to it but i'm like why even shatter yeah instead of just separate and distribute you know now some of you might be asking if death is removed from the lands between how come i can kill no! this dog first off shame on you second <laughs> from a law point of view that dog isn't really dead it's simply in the process of its spirit its soul returning to the Erd Tree. Uh, catacomb dungeons, for example, are specifically constructed near the roots of the Great Tree for this reason, so that the Erd Tree can reabsorb their ashes back into it. This process replaced the concept of a death that you were destined to have. But this random spirit outside of a catacomb dungeon says it best. The death means returning to the earth tree to have patience until the time comes. As that another example of this theory, uh, when you kill a major boss, you receive a remembrance of them. These are spirits, 
and they are hewn into the Erd Tree. In this way, thanks to the Erd Tree's grace, their spirits are immortalized, in a sense. This new form of death also explains what's happening when you summon spirits. From ash and return to the Erd Tree. However, some spirits never return to the Erd Tree, and they rise within death as corpses or skeletons uh, instead. Death is supposed to be replaced by you returning to the tree. Um, and I guess being tarnished is like when the tree is, dis is a grace is pulling you back out. And that's okay. Okay. Uh, let me just read that line again. Sorry. The unthinkable, uh, unthinkable, our hallowed resting place is violated. To refuse the earth tree's call to return, to live with the so death, this sickening. Was the new order. Mm -hmm. And it's important to stress that it was in this moment, when the rune of death was removed, when destined death was taken, this is when order became the golden order. The forbidden shadow plucked from the golden order upon its creation. Specifically, this was Marika's golden order. So not only did she become a god and a vessel for the Elden Ring, she became renowned as Marika the Eternal for her removal of destined death. It was a huge part of her character and her reign as well. However, Marika had more than just death to conquer, she had wars to fight, as the world was occupied by many forces that could threaten her golden order. There was war with the Storm Lord, who likely ruled over Stormvale. And there was a war with the Giants, who were masters of a flame that could burn the Erd Tree. There was war with the Ancient Dragons, who incidentally had stones that could twist time and thus slay a god. And finally, there was war brewing with the Carrion Royalty, who had previously obeyed laws which contravened the Golden Order. Thus, sort of similar to how the Greater Will needed an Empyrean to enforce its will, Marika herself needed someone to wage war. So, there was to be a husband, a consort, an Elden Lord. It's kind of like code for the world. Right? Like, this is how, this is what happens when you die. Not if I fuck with it. <laughs> If parentheses, da, 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 da. yeah, put a couple, put a couple uh, 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 semicolons yeah. in there. <laughs> put your comments. Yeah, it's 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 world code. The backyard. <laughs> <laughs> Here God we damn it! Go. Will you stop talking about the backyard? <laughs> <laughs> the man chosen was Horalu a ferocious warrior who became known as the Lord of the Battlefield. His crown was warranted with strength, and while it was for this strength that Marika married him, he was also required to take a vow to conduct himself as a lord. Right. To suppress the ceaseless lust for battle right. that raged within, Horalu took the beast regent Sarosh upon his back. You'll notice this is another example of a beast being given for the purpose of serving order. Nine to five. Thus, in this moment, he went from being Horalu warrior to Godfrey, the first Elden Lord, consort to Queen Marika, and a certified demigod. You gotta impress the parents. Godfrey and Marika had three demigod children together. There was Godwin the Golden, who you saw being killed in the opening trailer, and there were also the reviled Omen twins, Morgoth, who guards the Erd Tree, and Moog, who became Lord of Blood. You might think that Godric was another demigod child, but he actually wasn't. Instead, he was probably descended from Godwin. Anyway, we'll talk about the demigods more in detail in another video, so subscribe for that. But for now, just know that Godfrey and his offspring were the first demigods, henceforth known as the Golden Lineage. He doesn't count! In his wars, what? Godfrey led his 16 Crucible Knights into battle, who were named so for they fought with the primordial powers of the Erd Tree. Their incantations were aspects of the Crucible itself, and they likely fought giants, dragons, the Storm Lord, and more to usher in their Sorry, fought. sorry, Their incant sorry. who were in his wars, henceforth known as the Golden Lineage. In his wars, Godfrey led his sixteen crucible knights into battle. Sixteen. But 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 crucible knights are knights that represent the old order, that that represent the older tree, that are shunned like the misbegotten and the omen, and the new order would not want to use the old things. Uh, 
I thought we just established that. Did did you guess why that, that was? Too? I was with you. I was with you. Yeah. The Crucible Knights are the older order. So if Godfrey's coming along and using them as part of the new order, that uh, is a bit confusing because I thought they were like to be shunned alongside the misbegotten and the, um, you know, um, the misbegotten and the, um, and the omens, right? Anything talking about whatever used to be before the Erdtree. Who were named so for they fought with the primordial powers of the Erdtree. Their incantations were aspects of the Crucible itself, and they likely fought giants, dragons, the Storm Lord, and more to usher in their age. The age of the Erd Tree. In Marika's own words, Hark, brave warriors. Hark, my Lord Godfrey. We commend your deeds. Guidance hath delivered ye through each ordeal to the place ye stand. Put the giants to the sword and confine the flame atop the mount. Let a new epoch begin, an epoch glistening with life. Brandish the Elden Ring for the age of the Erd Tree. The Erd Tree would go on to be largely seen as a blessing for all of those in the lands between, especially those close to it in Lanedell, the capital city of the Erd Tree. The tree bestowed blessings. For example, the dew that dropped from its branches were like jewels. It loomed overhead as a constant reminder of order, and its roots reached far and wide, relieving many of the burden of death. In fact, Erd Tree burial was one of the highest honors a hero could receive. One by one, the previous factions of the world fell. The giants were put to the sword, and their fell god was killed by Marika herself. <laughs> the ancient dragons broke down the walls of Lanedell, but met fierce retaliation. However, I think the House of the Erd Tree encountered the most trouble against the land to their southwest, Leonia. Here, the House of the Moon repelled their offensives time and time again. And I mean that literally, because there was not just one, but two wars fought here, and in both of these, there was no victory for the Golden, nor for the Moon. And I suspect it was probably because of these lobsters. <laughs> these damn things can snipe you from like a mile away, and mm -hmm. it's bullshit. Actually, it was probably because of the Carrion Knights, who, according to their weapons, were able to wield sorcerous God, battle skills, still and despite numbering fewer than 20, this power made them a match for even the champions of gold in battle. Fewer than 20? These enchanted I don't remember knights that. were anointed by the Lunar Queen a young astrologer who went on to establish the House of Caria as royalty in this land. With her bewitching <laughs> lunar magic, she won over the Academy of Raya Lucaria, where glintstone sorcery was studied, and united the Carian royal family and the learned scholars of Raya Lucaria defended their home from the golden aggressors. At the head of this great golden army was Radagon. Lord Radagon was a great champion possessed of flowing red locks. He came to these lands at the head of a great golden host when he met Lady Renala in battle. These two champions clashed, fell in love, and joined their houses. Radigan once cleansed himself with celestial dew, repented his territorial aggressions, and swore his love to Renala. The order of the Erdtree and the fate of the moon were conjoined and all the wounds of war forgiven. You might think it's strange that the greater will would permit this union, mm -hmm. but it's not too odd, all things considered. As with most From Software games, sorcery and faith are just two sides of the same coin, and both of these powers stem from the cosmos. Radagon and Renala were known to have three children together. Luna Princess Rani, who inherited her mother's propensity for lunar magic, Radan, who took after his father Radagon yeah, yeah, yeah. and would go on to master gravitational magic, and Rikard, who pioneered new hex sorceries and would go on to feed himself to a great serpent. It follows that at some point after this, Marika began to harbor doubts. Doubts about the Golden Order that she had had a hand in creating. In Marika's own words, I declare mine intent to search the depths of the Golden Order 
through understanding of the proper way, our faith, our grace is increased. Those blissful early days of blind belief are long past. My comrades, why must ye falter? And it's at this point that we should talk about Marika's motivations, her character. Mm -hmm. This is surely going to be uh, one of those huge points of debate in the coming years. But for now, my working theory is that she wanted to discover the truth behind order and the truth behind the greater will. And she believed that bonds had to be broken so that they could be better understood. She believed that there was great meaning to be found in hardship. Queen Marika has high hopes for us that we continue to struggle unto eternity. For Lord Godfrey, his struggle ended at the end of his campaigns. According to his armor, he led the war against the giants, faced the Storm Lord alone. And then there came a moment when his last worthy enemy fell. And it was then, as the story is told, that the hue of Lord Godfrey's eyes faded. In truth, he was robbed of his grace. Then Marika sent him away. My lord, and thy warriors, I divest each of thee of thy grace. With thine eyes dimmed, ye will be driven from the lands between. Ye will wage war in a land afar, where ye will live and die. This became known as the Long March of the Tarnished, as Godfrey and his tarnished descendants walked away from the lands between. But Queen Marika absolutely had a plan here, that Lord Godfrey and his descendants would one day return stronger, having struggled outside of grace. Then, after thy death, I will give back what I once claimed, return to the lands between wage war, and brandish the Elden Ring, grow strong in the face of death, warriors of my lord, Lord Godfrey. Soon after, she found a new husband. Either that or a new husband was found for her. When Godfrey, first Elden Lord, was hounded from the lands between, Radigan left Renala to return to the Erdtree capital becoming Queen Marika's second husband and King Consort, taking the title of Second Elden Lord. The mystery endures to this day as to why Lord Radigan would cast Lady Renala aside, and moreover, why a mere champion would be chosen for the seat of Elden Lord. Whatever the case, as a part of this union, Radagon's prior three children with Renala became demigod stepchildren, granted grace thanks to their new family tree. Mm -hmm. Renala was broken by this, and so was her country, Leonia. The Queen's set reads, when Renala, head of both the Academy of Raya Lucaria and the Carrion royal family, lost her husband Radagon, her heart went along with him. And then those at the Academy realized that Renala was no champion after all. In the wake of Radagon's betrayal, and Renala's poor judgment, Leonia struggled with civil war, with the Academy of Raya Lucaria on one side and the Carrion Royals on the other. And it's here, during the Age of the Erd Tree, that Luna Princess Rani, daughter of Renala and Radagon, stole a fragment of the Rune of Death. It happened okay. during the Golden Age. We just have to move past the idea of marrying yourself for now, and those individuals being one and the same person. We just have to, you just have to take it as two for a minute for the min for a moment and, and establish what else is going on because there's no other way. Because like, <laughs> it's like, like the statue is there, but at that moment, is Radagon outside? I hereby <laughs> pronounce you Garnet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. You're Garnet. <laughs> You're, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. All right age of the Erd Tree, long before the shattering of the Elden Ring. Someone stole a fragment of the Rune of Death from Maleketh, the Black Blade. 
As mentioned previously, Malekith was Marika's shadow, and he had sealed Destined Death in a black blade. Then a fragment, only a fragment, of this Rune of Death was stolen. And once this happened, Malekith went a step further in protecting Destined Death. He bound the blade within his own flesh, such that none might rob Death ever again. It was too late, however. This fragment of the Rune of Death was, was used immediately, that night, to kill a demigod, Marika's own son, Godwin the Golden. That was the first recorded death of a demigod in all history, and it became the catalyst. Soon, the Elden Ring was smashed, and thus sprang forth the war known as the Shattering. Now, there is a lot of really credible evidence that Marika was behind this plot to have a fragment of the Rune of Death stolen. Mm -hmm. There's also a ton of evidence that Marika is behind the entirety of your tarnished quest, but we'll talk about that in another video. For now, all you really need to know, in terms of the timeline at least, is this. After the marriage of Marika and Radagon, and after a fragment of the Rune of Death was stolen, Marika went on to shatter the Elden Ring, and Radagon attempted to repair it, to no avail. The Elden Ring had been broken into runes, some great and some small. You know, it's said that Lord Radagon harbored a secret. A famed sculptor of the Erdtree capital was once summoned to render Lord Radagon's likeness in giant stature when he glimpsed the skeleton in Radagon's closet. And as such, it's said the great statue harbors his secret too. Of course, the huge twist in Elden Ring is that Radagon is Marika. Or depending on what you believe, he became her. For she knew it was going to happen. In Marika's own words, O oh Radagon, leal hound of the Golden Order, thou art yet to become me. Mm -hmm. Thou art yet to become, become a, a god. god. Let us be shattered, both mine other self. You can tell when From Software is keeping something a little bit open-ended, <laughs> and of everything in Elden Ring's lore, this will also go on to be one of the biggest unknowns Mother as we move you forward. Father, For example, the wording, thou art yet to become me, reinforces that Marika and Radagon were two separate entities before the Shattering. However, in contrast, there is also evidence that Radagon was always part of Marika. For example, Enya says that The demigods are each and all the direct offspring of Queen Marika. But how can this be if Radagon married Renala and had those demigod children? The only way that makes sense is if Radagon was always Marika and he just went over there to seduce Renala long ago. Yeah. I'll present more concrete theories in the you future, don't but on have this matter, the most important thing is, not already what do you think? While you can figure out a ton of Elden Ring story, not all of it is open to interpretation. Certain things are, and this is one of them. And your interpretation is a big part of what makes this story special. <laughs> At any rate, the union of Radagon uh. and Marika seems to be a union of two fundamental opposing laws of the Golden Order. We mentioned these laws earlier, actually. Mm -hmm. There's the law of causality, and Marika is an agent of cause and effect. Okay, I like that. And there's like the that. law of regression. I like that. As Radagon is a character who aspires to be complete and regress together. They, rep they so represent each one. So I have a theory that That's forcing cool. these two beings that represent these concepts together would have corrected Marika's deviance. Uh, but even so, she was imprisoned in the Erd Tree for the crime of the Shattering. Marika's trespass demanded a heavy sentence. But even in shackles, she remains a god and the vision's vessel. The conjoined Radagon and Marika even had two demigod children of their own, Mikola and Millennia. These two children were born afflicted. Mikola was cursed with eternal childhood, and Millennia harbored a horrific rot within. Even so, these two children were both chosen as Empyreans. They were immensely sacred beings and eligible to inherit godhood from the Greater Will. Perhaps the Greater Will was just desperate to find a worthy successor, and indeed in the Shattering War to come, many would try to claim the Shards of the Elden Ring, and they would try to take the throne, including, of course, the Tarnished, who returned from their long march 
at long last. Yeah, I, 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 like, it doesn't make sense to try and um, parse out Radagon as being, like, someone normal that then just comes in to become a part of Marika later. Because Radagon's own, like, origins and family beforehand, like he said, are, are already lead to demigod kids. And then when they eventually do unite, they do create more kids. Um, admittedly afflicted ones, but, um, the idea of like, yeah, it's, you're yet to become me. It's like, okay, so like, at what point is that message being delivered? You know, is that like, uh, pre union? Is that post union? If it is about union, then like, is that where the kids are then uh, conceived, you know, or are the kids conceived pre union and then they become what like it, yeah. it, it, it's very muddled, which we'll talk about in the next main law video. Cool. I should probably also mention here that if you become a patron, you'll see upcoming law videos early as that's one of the rewards you get if you pledge to the $3 tier. And if you think my channel really adds a lot of value to the Souls games for you to the point where you pledge $20, then in this new tier, yeah. you'll receive a new mug every three months Hashtag that has ad. a unique Hashtag design on chill. it to do with the game Absolutely. by From Software. There are four to collect. The first one you'll get is inspired by Dark Souls, then Elden Ring, then Sekiro, and finally Bloodborne. And they all have fantastic art that I worked on with an amazing artist named Chu. But anyway, I figured this is the right place to end this video okay. because the information Support. here... Support! It's going to be overwhelming. Support I the quality. It probably was too overwhelming, you know? It took me ages to commit these names and the relationships they had with other characters to memory, so I hope you guys are doing alright. One thing that helped me a lot was that we designed an enormous mind map <laughs> with pretty much all of Elden Ring's lore. All of its item descriptions, all of its dialogues, all of the relationships between characters that we can think of. We added all of this together and Go it helped a ton in yourself. learning about the story and visualizing oh, it all. And one God. day I will make this asset available to you all because I think after doing it, I think this is the quintessential way to piece together the story and I think giving you guys this asset eventually will make that accessible for Ooh. people. So I'm really excited about that. I want to thank Absa and Zard for accepting Only if we the can put on the gold mask before we read it. Raw data into this mind map that's how you so become gold mask. I can mask. better understand everything. <laughs> I want to you thank you for read fulfilling that Excel all of my file. footage requests and creating so many cinematic scenes for this video and for you all to enjoy. And I last of all want to thank John Devlin for the incredible thumbnail. And of course, Damn, thank you for fuck watching. With the students. There are some really exciting things ahead, and I actually believe this might be the best story that From Software have ever put together. I just think not only are there so many amazing item descriptions, but so many of them are impactful. There are so many moments where you piece together the story and have like a eureka moment, and I'm enjoying it so much. But now I'm going to go and play the game a little bit because I've been editing this video for too long. So <laughs> enjoy. See you next time. Right on. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So, of course, there's more. There's more to, to piece together. Uh, there's the there's the demigods, but just to to take a little breather, a little um, yeah, uh, intermission. Um, yeah, the most cromulent thing I would I, I feel about all of that is I really I like the idea of. Uh, causality represents Marika and regression rep represents Radagon. That's cool. That's a nice aspect to, um, to look at because, like, it's clear whether or not we can understand the, the, the whys of it. Grimm wants duality to be the main thing here. Like two aspects to everything. Everything is two things. Feels to be like one of the like golden written rules about this world when he started putting the lore together. Like everything has a reflection. Everything has a shadow. Everything has a second name. Everything has a, a, a an alternate version of itself mm. one way or another. 
you know, and it repeats itself infinite times throughout the story in the largest and smallest possible ways, you know, from D having two aspects to, to just like, yeah, literally like, oh, that's not my real name. My real name was Morgoth, like all of that. Um, and then, of course, you know, like uh, twins and such. And uh, yeah, there's so much of that in repetition. So um, it it stands to reason that like those two laws that you get, you don't get other laws. You don't get all the other, you know, you collect a bunch of runes mm -hmm. that are the, that make up the ingredients of the Elden Ring, but you only get those two laws, you know, and those, and it, and it seems as if uh, reasonably one can assume that you have to put all those ingredients with the runes together with those laws as well in place to create the shape and to structurally lock it into place. Yeah. Um, as for how and why and what the mechanics of having kids with yourself is, is just no way, no way to parse that together. Um, but the idea that Marika, like... Stepped into the role. Okay. The idea that Marika was chosen as a Newman, stepped into the role, helped establish, uh, you know, the greater will's um, um, instructions, gave Malekith the root of death, said, you take over this now. Death, and now, and now the Erd tree is the way that we worship and the way that we die. Um, and then started changing her mind about things and then that change of heart led to her um orchestrating the 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 theft against her own you know the betrayal the leading into the night of black knives um does that change of mind also lead to her sending uh godfrey away you know or is that uh, in part of the time beforehand because if he's around and then uh, that's because that's the divorce right that's essentially like the idea is like okay uh, I want to change things around I want to undo what the greater will's intentions are here so this dude that I've brought in as the king to represent this order and hold it down as well needs to go um, and it wouldn't be unreasonable to think that like she already was thinking, because I got to reunite with myself, who's also Radagon over there, <laughs> you know, who has yet to become me. But I'm I'm over there, and we I got to reunite with myself. Mm -hmm. So as much fun as I'm having, having a family over there and whatnot, I got to get rid of current hubby to make room for that, because that's an important part of what comes next. Perhaps, you know? Yeah. Um, but the, the, the key thing, I guess, is the idea that she had a change of heart and change of mind, which is why, like, it seems like she does some things and then that's in line with what, what the greater will wanted. And then later it seems like it's not, you know? Okay. Let's see what the, the demigods uh, are about. Are each and all the direct offspring of Queen Marika. There was Godwin, Morgoth, Moog, Radan. Rikard, Rani, Mikola, and Melania, Blade of Mikola. Melania, Blade of Mikola. Melania, Blade of Mikola, and Melania. <laughs> Not again. All of these demigods had fallen from grace by the time the shattering occurred. But in this video, I want to mostly talk about the origins of these characters. Who these demigods were before the fall. Fallen from grace and before some the shattering. These demigods fell a long way indeed. Really? Before he became this Before the mess, Godwin the Golden was quite the heroic figure. He was born of the promising union between Lord Godfrey and Queen yeah. Marika, and he achieved great renown for his bravery in one of their wars at least, the War of the Ancient Dragons. This war began when Grandsax, a great ancient dragon, rained calamity down upon Lanedell, marking the only time in historical record that Lanedell's walls had fallen. It's not clear why Grandsax first attacked, but fortifying themselves against lightning, the Knights of the Erd Tree weathered his assault and Grandsax was defeated. However, this was only the beginning, and a bitter war against the ancient dragons was to follow. 
During this war, the Earth Tree Sentinels had an epiphany that the only way to truly protect the Earth Tree was to become dragons themselves. And so, despoiling the corpses of their foes, the grotesque sentinels served the Erd Tree, but fought with the claws of the enemy instead. In the end, the ancient dragons were routed once again. In a graveyard of swords by the Stormcaller Church, the end of the war is commemorated. Here, we learn that during battle, Godwin the Golden defeated Fortisax, called the mightiest dragon of them all. However, he did not kill Fortisax. Instead, he befriended him, and it was in this act that the powers of the ancient dragons truly became a part of Laindel. After all, only those loved by dragons can survive the ordeal of cladding their bodies in lightning. So, wow. from an unlikely friendship, an ancient dragon Not cult, cult was born the in the capital city, and the knights of Laindel learned to worship the dragons and wield their lightning. Battle buddy count two. That's the... Uh, Radagon and Renala fought until they went, damn, what's up? You're kind of nice. And then here, you're not bad, human. You're not bad, dragon. All right, you're okay, get in. <laughs> Although the former, we, 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 we have christened that a good old fight fuck <laughs> as opposed to fuck fighting. <laughs> yeah, okay, but two sequences of we fight until we're, we're like, till we're pals. Lanciax, sister of Fortisax, even took human form to better commune with the knights. It was officially decided that the worship of the ancient dragons did not conflict with belief in the Erd Tree, and it was all thanks to Godwin, hmm. commander of the dragon's golden lightning, and a true child of the golden lineage. But now, let's talk about Morgoth and Moog, the Omen twins, who were also born of Godfrey and Marika's golden lineage. First, what is an Omen? Well, to put it simply, an Omen is an accursed child seen as impure, as they are born with horns on the body and face. When this happens, the correct thing to do, culturally at least, is to cut off the horns of the Omen, mm -hmm. an act which usually causes them to perish pretty messed up, but some omen do survive this process, and some omen are even given a cleaver, crafted specifically for them and awarded as a tool of war, although these weapons are bestowed with a readiness to take them away. We find one such omen in an Erd Tree camp upon the Altus Plateau. Before you fight it, you might have noticed another omen nearby writhing in its sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you saw that. It said mm -hmm. that omens see evil spirits in their nightmares, and I think this omen is dreaming, haunted by the vengeful spirits of its accursed mm -hmm. kin. This brings us to the omen killers who are horrifying butchers of twisted conscience. They wear these horned masks that make a mockery of the omen's nightmares, and these butchers hunt the omen and amputate their horns. And that the mask is what they see. was named Rollo, a famous perfumer who had to imbibe a physic to rid himself of emotion so that he could better perform his tasks. Remember, it seems many omen have their horns excised when they're very young. That's definitely disturbing enough to warrant an emotion-killing physic mm -hmm. in my book. However, if the omen is born of royalty, then their horns are not cut off, but the omen is kept underground, unbeknownst to anyone, and imprisoned for eternity. By way of example, you would have seen all kinds of omen confined to the sewers mm -hmm. beneath Lane Dell. But why are omen considered to be accursed in the first place? Some of them are clearly intelligent, so what's inherently wrong with being born with horns and great strength? Well, it's important to remember, I think, that this curse might only really exist in the context of the Golden Order. After all, those afflicted with omen horns are not able to return to the Erd Tree for rebirth and are said to be born outside of its grace. But why does the Golden Order disavow the omen, then? Well, it's hard to say for sure, but my working theory is that it's to do with the Crucible. According to this ancient incantation, horns were once an aspect of the Erd Tree's primordial Fuck. Crucible, where all life was once blended together. Oh, shit. And with the exception of account? a couple of Crucible Aspect of the Crucible horn. 
I didn't even think about that. Motherfucker. All life was once blended together. And with the exception of a couple of crucible nights in and around Landell, we know that the Golden Order has started to distance itself from most things that touch upon the crucible. While things like horns, knots, feathers, and scales once grew on the human body and were considered signifiers of the divine, now they are disdained as impurities as civilization has w advanced. Once worshipped, right? That was a description on something uh, omen related or misbegotten related. I'm like, uh, I, f I feel like I'm vaguely remembering an item description that said that, like, once upon a time, the horns were a good thing, but oh. now now horn bad. Yeah, I don't. I can't recall. Is there um, not talisman? Say that again. Crucible not. Oh. Okay. Something that we read a description Crucible for. Crucible not. Is there a description? Crucible not talisman. Similar description. I don't have the full description. I will have to look it up. Okay. Uh, yeah. Again, it's at the bottom of the oh, screen oh, in a place oh. we can't read, unfortunately. Uh, Go ahead. There's something born partially of devolution, was con considered a signifier of the divine in ancient times. Crucible feather Perfect. talisman. Excellent. Yep. Was considered divine in ancient times. Okay. The Absolutely. crucible feather tal talisman. Yep. Yeah. yep. 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 There we go. Um, and uh devolution of course uh another potential like an another potential regression mm. signifier we learn this from the knot scale and feather talismans all of which are guarded by omen or dropped by omen killers no less unfortunately for the order of the Erd tree these once divine impurities seem to crop up in some births whether they like it or not mm -hmm. almost like it's a genetic trait as if it touches upon the crucible at the root of the Erd tree and so you have to ask is it really a curse to be born as a graceless omen well as with most curses in these games i think that depends on your perspective in any case moog and morgoth were omen royalty and thus, they were born into a wretched mire far below the earth, horns and all. Here, they were kept under the strictest confinement. Each of them were bound with charmed shackles that were covered in roots or thorns and bathed in golden magic. It seems very few people were supposed to know that they even existed. Morgoth, for his part, renounced and despised his accursed oh. omen blood, but his brother Moog embraced it. Deep underground, Moog stood before an outer god, a being called the Formless Mother who craves wounds, a being capable of bestowing power upon accursed blood. In this moment, Moog's accursed blood erupted with fire, and he became besotted with the defilement that he was born into. Here, deep below the earth, he would go on to build a dynasty of blood in reverence of a mother, something it seems he never truly had. As for Morgoth, he was born into the same accursed fate as his twin brother, but despite not being blessed with grace, he loved the Erd Tree all the same, and Whoa. even took it upon himself to crawl out of the sewers and become the Erd Tree's protector when the Erd Tree needed him most. In the end, he rightfully became the Omen King and Lord of Landell. Omen or not, he was, after all, born of Godfrey and Marika's golden lineage. Of course, the marriage between... Do you think that's a, that's uh, implying that like he becomes Lord of Landell like after Landell's fallen and fucking empty, as opposed to Omen Lord of Living Landell, right? Because I remember we had a brief moment, or at least I I, remember, I was thinking about like, hold on a minute, you're the Lord, you're an Omen, and like this capital city is supposed to accept that, and it's like, yeah. no, 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 Landell's fallen. It's empty. It's a fucking mess. I took it because there was. No I'm lineage. the lord of this empty ass yeah. kingdom. I'm of the lineage. Yeah, I deserve. Rightfully it. so. Yeah, but streets is empty. <laughs> Queen Godfrey and Marika would be ended, and before long, Marika remarried with another man, a champion named Radigan, who Marika calls her other half. He became second Elden Lord and the king consort, but he also brought with him three children from a previous marriage that he had had with a carrion queen named Renala. These children were Rani, 
Rikard and Radan, and they all became demigod stepchildren after Radigan's union, reunion with Queen Marika. Possessed of his father's flaming red hair, Radan was fond of its heroic implications and considered himself to be born of a great champion, yet he also looked up to another man, Godfrey, the first Elden Lord, Queen Marika's first husband and the Lord of the Battlefield. But Radan wasn't just the son of Radigan. There's a war memorial in game that says Morgoth uh, led the invasion forces during the second siege of Landell. Oh, that's true. He was one of he was uh, he was the one attacking the city. Yes, I remember we were talking about like how could he be the one who felled many champions of Landell, oh, shit. but also be its lord. And that would be because he like was attacking and then he was an enemy and then after the dust settles he's now he's now ruling it oh okay i do remember yeah i forgot yeah i don't yeah i didn't remember that more got the grace given he defended the city did we you know what Lord I of do, the capital at the foot of the earth. It said, def- but do you remember when we got confused on, like, the thing about him? Um, like, he defended the city, but also many heroes fell at his at his hand. Um, well, let's see if I can't uh, get the exact text up to show you. Because I remember specifically getting in um getting uh, a little twisted by the uh the text on that um are the memorial texts in the wiki no they're not um they might be in a discussion thread uh bup, 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 bup. okay scrape 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 The Battle of Aeonia, Le Seclarian War, Castle of Siegeborn, um, Godfrey. Okay, I think I have a list of them here. Um, the first defense of Lane Dell, uh, and the second defense of Lane Dell. The fell omen stacks high the corpses of heroes, yet the Erd Tree remains unshaken. Right? Right? So this is where I went. If oh, yeah. We were wondering on which if, side. And if Margit, the fell omen, is defending Landell, why is it framing it such that the corpses of heroes are being stacked by him? Do you understand? So you guys, you, what you're talking about with the defense, this is where we got st- we got stun locked again, because it it is the, the wording of that is like like the second defense of Landell. Margit stacks the corpses of heroes high, yet the Erd Tree remains unshaken. So, like someone stacking the corpses of heroes high in that sentence framing makes them sound like a bad guy, right? If, if I'm, and, and, and if I follow that up with yet the hero, yet the tree, your, your tree remains unshaken. It's like, we lost a lot of heroes to the market, but the Erd tree still stands. stands. That's how the English language would make that make yeah. sense. When that happened, we said, oh, maybe it's a possible. Like, we had, yeah, and we just something. walked away on it. But like, and like, I, I'm totally open to being infinitely wrong on this, but Got that sentence reads like Margit is the bad one who is stacking the bodies of our heroes, and then the memorial is there. That's how that reads, yeah. right? So, um, if he was defending, then like, would they be calling their enemies heroes, right? That's that's not it, doesn't yeah. the, the word defending doesn't seem to work into the way we've read, read this. Like, what's another way of writing that sentence to make me understand what I'm not understanding, but what they see? 
I think they're seeing like heroes as like both sides, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Maybe Japanese translation would have a more clear reading of it. Yeah. Okay. So the second defense of Lane Dell. Margit stacks high the corpses of strong enemies, but the urge tree remains unshaken. Enemies is still like alignment. I'm replacing yeah. the word heroes with strong enemies to see if that is yeah. what we're talking about here. It feel of champions, of enemy champions that we're calling heroes. Perhaps. Doesn't that seem like more of a stretch though? I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah. It feels as if the word heroes is used to describe your own people, which is why I'm getting a different response from what you guys are seeing here. Uh, but uh, that's heroes on both sides. I guess. I guess. Maybe. And, and this is definitely where, uh, yeah, going to the Japanese might be a little bit more of a, of a, a, a clear uh, road on it because that would be, it would be an odd use of the word heroes, perhaps, you know. All right, anyway, let's move on. And an aspiring lord of the battlefield, he was also the son of Ranala, who was head of the Academy of Raya Lucaria and Queen of Caria. So as a Carian royal, inclined towards sorcery, Radan bent his will towards mastering gravitational magics. Mm -hmm. Rock sling, gravity well, collapsing stars. These techniques were taught to him in Celia, the town of sorcery, all so he would never have to abandon his beloved but scrawny steed. That said, before long, his powers would be put towards a more cosmic purpose than nice simply shot. allowing him to ride his own horse. Radan was taught gravitational magic by an alabaster lord, a member of a race of ancients with skin of stone who was said to have risen to life when a meteor struck long ago. And when his lessons were complete, Radan uttered these chilling words. Thank you for your tutelage. For now, I can challenge the stars. God damn it. And of course, Deleted he lines. did conquer the stars, and the very constellations would be halted by his strength. But of course, you kind of have to ask, why? Why was it necessary to conquer the stars in the first place? Oh, just voice acting well, of, a couple of, of theories. The, the script, Theory okay. one is that it was done in self-defense. After all, according to the... Because I was also saying, like, he didn't say Leonard yet, nope. which is a... I was like, say the name! <laughs> but Leonard is not in-game. <laughs> Leonard is, is, is data mine. It's data mine. Yeah. So if Leonard was a dev joke, you know, then then that would be an incorrect canon interpretation. Until Grimm himself says the name of the horse, Leonard is just is a, is a dev name. Lord Gravestone, Radan was protecting Celia. What's more, gravitational magic has destructive power, and many gravitational beasts are proof of that destructive power. A being named Astel had even come down to the lands between mm -hmm. in the past and destroyed a place called the Eternal City. What's more, Celians are descendants of the Eternal, positioned right above the Eternal City underground, so there is an argument to be made for Radan purely defending Celia for some reason here. But it's possible for Radan to have fought in this conflict and to have made the first move as well. So this is theory two, uh. that Radan conquered the stars as a preventative measure in service to the greater will. According to a uh, set okay, of hold on, let me, let me just get that again. Well, it's possible Radan, and right that's why Red Main is, is where it is. Celians asked for power, a being it was done in self-defense. Why? Why was it necessary to conquer the stars in the first place? Well, I have a couple of theories. Theory one is that it was done in self-defense. After all, according to the Sword Gravestone, Radan was protecting Celia. What's more, gravitational magic has destructive power. Okay, I don't remember that sword memorial. The Star Scourge conflict, Radan alone hold Celia secure and stands tall to shatter the stars. Motherfucker. Okay. So it wasn't just about the horse then. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, we saw that. Fair. Yeah. Got it. Radan, Radan to have fought in this conflict and to have made the first move as well. So this is theory two, that Radan conquered the stars as a preventative measure in service to the greater will. According to a set of astrologer items, the night sky cradles fate. 
There's even a banished sect of people called the Nox, who live deep below the earth in eternal anticipation of the coming age of stars and their lord of night. Long ago, these people invoked the ire of the greater will, so it would make sense that those in service to the greater will might have sought to arrest the stars and put an end to this fate. What's more, Radan was just a huge fanboy of Godfrey, and he seems to have more loyalty to the Erd Tree. <laughs> uh, 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 okay, hold on a second. Spies got the actual um, Jap- Japanese text for the second defense of Landell. Um... Let's see. They translated it directly into English without liberty. I see. Okay, so if we were to copy that and dump it in a translator unceremoniously, what would we get? Uh... Taking a look here. Okay. Golden Godric. No. Marenia. No. Kaerid. No. Kaelid. Uh, Jermia Volcano. Altar Plateau. Uh, Altar Plateau, actually, is what we were looking for. Uh, no. Actually, Capital. The second Rodal defense battle, the golden tree that builds the corpse of the hero, the abomination demon is unwavering. Okay. Well, the word hero is in fact there. Does it say Yusha? No. Um, yeah, that's a dirty, dirty Google translation there. All right, cool. Interesting. No liberties really taken. <laughs> Abomination demon. Omen. <laughs> Fell omen. Then to the moon. Finally, the telescope item description says that the fate once writ in the night skies had been they used AU for by the hero. golden order. Okay. So surely this is written. Finally, the telescope who the greater will might have sought to arrest the stars and put an end to this fate. What's more, Radan was just a huge fanboy of Godfrey, and he seems to have more loyalty to the Erd Tree than to the Moon. Finally, the telescope item description says that the fate once writ in the night skies had been fettered by the Golden Order, so surely this is referencing Radan's actions, and it levels the blame at the Golden Order. But putting Radan's motivations aside, it's a fact that the stars were held back, and that this had great consequences for many especially for the rest of his Carrion royal family. Let me explain. The fate of the Carrion royal family is guided by the stars, as is the fate of Lady Rani, first heir in the Carrion royal line. But General Radan is the conqueror of the stars, who stood up to the swirling constellations, halting their movement in a smashing victory. And so, if General Radan were defeated, the stars would once again resume their movement, as would Lady Rani's destiny. Luna Princess Rani was the daughter of Radigan and Renal. Sorry, one second. I'm going back to the, the, the gravestones again. Um... The Battle of Aeonia... Radon and Millennia. Yeah, that was after the first conflict, the Star Surge conflict. Star Scourge conflict. Radon holds Celia secure and stands tall um, to shatter the stars. Um, okay. Uh, sh- the... the um, Celia, we, we, we just watched it. Celia was under attack by whom? Whomst? Who was he defending from there? 
a member of a race of a go. Thank you for your tutelage. For and the very constellations would be halted by his strength. In the first place, well, I have a couple of theories. The sword gravestone destructive power, and many gravitational beasts are proof of that destructive power. A being place called the Eternal City, right above the Eternal City underground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there but... is an argument to be made for Radan. Okay, okay. Uh, bah. I was trying to, uh, yeah, okay. The stars themselves. I was trying to figure out, like, if that was any one main ca major character. Okay. Yeah, was any major character's motivation or, or, um, uh, was any one major character, like, using the stars that he was fighting against at that point? But that's a completely separate thing on its own, it seems. And then later he's fighting millennia and that's separate as well. So the stars themselves are just dropping monsters and bullshit. <laughs> And that's a problem. And that leads to the clearing out of Noxtella and Nocron. But, mm -hmm. um, and the stopping of the stars. But the stars themselves don't represent a given force of a demigod's army or something along those lines okay. attacking. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was just, I was like, who's, who's, who's he fighting? Yeah. All right. So, Rani. Stunny. Luna Princess Rani was the daughter of Radigan and Renala and sister to Radan. Interestingly, if you look at her true body atop the Divine Tower, it looks like she might have also inherited the red hair of Radigan. Oh. Cool detail. Oh. But unlike her brother, nice. Radan, she quite clearly took after her mother, Moore, who was Renala, head of the Carrion royal family. The House of Caria has this storied history, one that seems to go way back to the astrologers. In the Carrion Manor, we find one of their treasures, the Sword of Night and Flame. It reads, Astrologers who preceded the sorcerers established themselves in mountaintops that nearly touched the sky and considered the fire giants yeah, their neighbors. Renala herself was an astrologer, always chasing the stars in her youth. Then she met the full moon, and in time, the astrologer became a queen, establishing the House of Caria as royalty. Caria appears to have a matriarchal hierarchy, with multiple princesses and Caria knights that serve as their retainers. Now, however, there is only one princess, Rani, daughter of Renala. And at the time of her birth, she would have been set to inherit quite a lot of power indeed, for the Carrion royal family was at its height, and her mother was not only queen, she was also head, head of, of the uh, academy yeah. of Raya Lucaria, having bewitched them with the enchanting power of the full moon. Hey. Leading the young Rani by the hand, Renala guided her daughter to a meeting with a moon of her own. What Dark Rani one. beheld was cold, dark, and veiled in occult mystery. A dark moon, a sort of twin to Renala's own full moon. You can even see both of these hanging in the sky if you stargaze from the heights of the moonlight plateau. There's two. Another who guided Rani was a character called the Snowy Crone. Okay. That, who, that, the, would, that would make sense as to like the fact that she gets her own lunar spell as yeah. well. Huh, I didn't even Renala's moon moon, Rani's dark moon. Dark moon, yeah. yeah. I didn't even I didn't even catch that there was a that there was a second moon mm. in the sky. Mm. I didn't Young see Rani the sky, but I saw the deep text, in the woods. Yeah. When you look at Rani, it's actually the likeness of this snow witch that you're seeing, as the doll that now houses Rani's soul was modeled after her, probably as a sign of respect. Clearly, Rani looked up to this mysterious woman. She became Rani's secret mentor, and she even knew about the dark moon, teaching the young Rani to fear it as she imparted her cold sorceries. Not calling her so, Rena. What do these moons represent? That's just a theory, but I think the moons kind of act no as guides. Uh, the no lost confirmation. Black moon no confirmation. Of Noxtella, for Not example, calling her Rena. The guide of countless stars. What's more, Rani and Renala were heavily influenced by their moons. Renala's moon bewitched the academy that she became the head of, and Rani's dark moon, for its part, also imparts wisdom and leads a voyage in the Age of Stars ending. They could even be outer gods. And yet, for all of this guidance, Caria and Leonia as a whole have experienced steep decline. Radigan betrayed the House of the Moon. Radan locked the stars out of motion. The Academy town is flooded to the north. Caria has been ruined in the west, and the stars and moon have gone their separate ways. Nevertheless, Rani, last princess of Caria, remains, carefully setting new plans into motion. 
sibling to Rani and Radan was a man named Rikard, who was lord of the Volcano Manor. Mm. There is evidence- It fits, but so does the, so do the fell twins who are not in fact literally Morgoth and, and uh, Moog. Mm. So there's stuff that is like thematic and close, but not quite cigar. Um, the, um, yeah, one second, just with that line about the body. West and Raharia and even be outer gods. Edge in Rani's dark moon for its part also imparts wisdom and leads a voyage in the age of stars ending. They could even be outer gods. And yet, for all of this guidance, Caria and Leonia as a whole have experienced steep decline. Radigan betrayed the House of the Moon. Radan locked the stars out of motion. The Academy town is flooded to the north. Yeah. Caria has been ruined in the west, no. and the stars and moon have gone their separate ways. So he's, he's Nevertheless, acknowledging Rani, it as a betrayal of Radigan, of remains, and not necessarily a, a conspiracy the that they openly talked about that sibling to Rani people around them with the masks that were sworn to silence were not able to talk about. Because oh, I remember yeah. how we were talking about how like the mask notes that their servants were sworn to never tell the truth about the secret conversations yeah. they had. Then I was like, oh, is that an implication that Radagon told Renala some sort of s dark truth that, or, you know, was something that could never be known openly. And so, like, they still had to break up, but um, she, there's something else going on that, you know, she knows about. But maybe not. Maybe he just said, deuces. Yeah. Sign this prenup. A man named Rikard, who was lord of the Volcano Manor. There is evidence that Rikard was friendly with his siblings. Uh, he conspired with his sister Rani later on. Mm -hmm. And there's even a portrait of Radan hung in the Volcano Manor, as oh. well as a portrait Ooh. of Rikard himself before the fall. I haven't seen that. Item descriptions I think it's mark upstairs. Rikard as stern, ambitious, heroic, and blasphemous. A part of this blasphemy was opposing the Erd Tree which actually drew many knights to his banner, for Rikard believed in hey. taking by force, just as the gods did, and clearly many believed that he would usher in a new age. The armor set of the Gelmir knights reveals to us what were once very loyal soldiers. The crest of red feathers are there to symbolize now we Rikard's know why Bernal pedigree is there. as Lord Radigan's son, and the emblem upon their chest piece represents a lord who had lofty ambitions. However, as Rikard delved into the ancient secrets of Mount Gelmir, he came across the immortal Great Serpent, an ancient deity that aligned with Rikard's ambitions. And so, Rikard fed himself to the Great Serpent so that he might devour, grow, and live eternally. Alas, this was too much for his knights, and they believed that their master's heroic ambitions had degenerated into mere greed. So they searched desperately for a weapon with which they might halt their lord, and they found it too. The immortal serpent had lived for a long time, and so there was also a weapon to kill it that had been designed long ago as well, a serpent hunter. But it was too late. As the lord lost his dignity, so too did the knights lose their master. Now, to be fair, if you were serving that dude and you was up to big ambitions, and then that's the final form that he gets is a weird, shitty face sticking out of a snake's body, <laughs> you would kind of be like, eh, fuck this. Tanya, you sure? <laughs> if he turned out to have, uh, if he reverted to being a human form, but the power of a snake god was inside that, and it's like, okay. Now we that's about now we, yeah they're like yeah oh, let's yeah. go you they'd be super on board you know just like now you got like snake armor or some cool shit yeah and every once in a while you can just fucking like snake arm and go like ah, you know and then everyone be like oh let's go 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 you know but, but no instead. <laughs> instead you're just a face sticking out of the fucking thing and then it's like no that that you're like your weird man. your final form is lame I'm not following you anymore not that it bothered Rikard. Next, we need to discuss Melania, 
and Mikola. These two were twins as they were born. No, Reichardt, please. Anyway, as you know, Radigan's marriage with Renala did not last. Afterwards, he returned mm -mm. to the Golden Order and became Queen Marika's consort. But what I haven't yet mentioned is that together they were blessed with two demigod children, the so-called twin prodigies. Now, in the last little video, I briefly proposed that these two twins were born after the Shattering, after Radigan and Marika had merged together to become a single god. However, I've since changed my mind. I think Millennia and Mikula were clearly born before the Shattering. There's just so much proof that these two twins were a force that were influencing the world long before the Shattering took place. Uh, anyway, both of these twins were born afflicted. Specifically in the Japanese text, it's said that their births were vulnerable. Mikula was born afflicted with eternal youth, and Millennia, for her part, was vulnerable to rot. Interestingly, Millennia's Scarlet Rot is actually an outer god. This outer god, like many others in the game, seems to have an order that is able to be imposed upon the world via an Empyrean vessel, and Millennia was that vessel. And while the Scarlet Rot is pretty terrible, uh, you can sort of argue that it's got a beauty to it. Um, according to Gowrie, the Order of Rot is resplendent. It's a cycle of death and rebirth. Kind of like the Lotus Flower, which is a flower that blooms anew, beautiful and fresh, from mud. I actually have art of this flower hanging in my home, I always love the symbol of it. I actually have lots of art hanging now, and I'm going to talk about all of this artwork that you can buy at the end of the video. Anyway, so Millennia the Empyrean was vulnerable to and afflicted by the Scarlet Rot. There was said to be no cure to this, and while fire and consecration seemed to be somewhat effective at warding it off, Millennia would slowly lose her physical self to the Rot. Interestingly, old legends of the Scarlet Rot have persisted in the world for generations, and we learn more about the Rot did God. The, uh, did the Rot the God dancer, just target Chow. her in birth? The Dancer in Blue represents a fairy who, in legend, bestowed a flowing sword upon a blind swordsman. Blade in hand, the swordsman sealed away an ancient god, a god that was Rot itself. Specifically, this god was long ago sealed away in the stagnant water that is downstream of the Ainsel River underground. And wherever rot appears, the kindred of rot appear as well. Mm -hmm. These are pests and servants of the rot. And now, in the current age, these are servants that have been forsaken by Millennia, who is their new goddess. So, this blind swordsman with the flowing curved sword yeah. actually went on to become Millennia's mentor. So technically it's him that we have to blame for this goddamn attack. <laughs> the prosthesis wearer heirloom tells us more. A talisman engraved with a scene from a heroic tale. Though born into the accursed rot, when the young girl encountered her mentor and his flowing blade, she gained wings of unparalleled strength. Millennia's ridiculous attack is called the Waterfowl Dance, and aesthetically it makes sense that, you know, flowing waters would counter the effects of rot, for just as still waters turn foul, stagnation turns to decay, thus warriors must remain ever drifting. And indeed, Millennia does resist the call of the rot, there's a lot of evidence that she's not really a willing vessel, but through sheer will and sense of self, she resists the rot, and only when she is truly pressed in battle will she abandon this will and bloom into the goddess within. Millennia's first bloom was during her fight against Radan, and releasing her scarlet rot was a last ditch effort that would forever taint the land of Kaled and cripple Radan. So, whatever she was One fighting for second. in this fight against Radan, was that the needle scarlet really, really quickly? This and only what? when she is ill. The arm breaks self, off. She resists the rot. And she grabs the sword. Only when she is truly pressed in battle will yeah, she, she abandon the other hand. this will and bloom oh, okay, into okay, the goddess okay. within. Battle, For a second, I thought that little shot of a, of a line right there. Thing. I was like, is that the needle of go like being removed? Yeah, okay, no, 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 no. I'm bloom just into the goddess whatever, within. Silly. Millennia's first bloom was during her fight against Radan, and releasing her scarlet rot was a last ditch effort that would forever taint the land of Kaled and cripple Radan. So, whatever she was fighting for in this fight against Radan, somehow it was worth this terrible act. In general terms, at least, it's clear that Millennia was fighting for her brother. 
Apart from First the times blue. where she relapses into being the goddess of rot, she is known as the Blade of Mikula. She actually goes to great lengths to tell you this. I don't know if you heard. Uh, despite being the toughest boss in From Software history, she's actually fighting for his right to godhood, not her own. In Millennia's own words, her brother Mikula possesses the wisdom, the allure of a god. He is the most fearsome Empyrean of all. For his part, Mikola did a lot to earn his sister's dedication, not the least of which was inspiring her armor and a prosthetic of unalloyed gold. And it's not just his sister that loved Mikola, many people did. The Bewitching Branch is an item that you can use to turn enemies into temporary allies, and it reads, Indeed, he has learned very well Do I have how that? to compel such I affection. I think so. For his father Radigan, Mikola fashioned and gifted to him a fundamentalist incantation <laughs> called branch. Triple Rings of Light. Radigan Maybe then we returns didn't have the, the favor, for it. Guess gifting I didn't use back it. an incantation called Radigan's Rings of Light. These interactions show some of Mikola's positive connections with his father and also Golden Order fundamentalism. And yet, the young Mikola abandoned fundamentalism for it could do nothing to treat Millennia's accursed rot. This was the beginning of unalloyed gold. So, what is unalloyed gold? Well, an alloy is a composition of metals, so unalloyed gold is pure gold essentially, with no external mixtures. This gold apparently can ward away the meddling of outer gods, and so Mikola bent a lot of his efforts towards creating an unalloyed gold needle. Specifically, this needle was crafted for his sister, to ward off the rot god and forestall the effects of the incurable rotting sickness. We see the bond between the siblings as well when we visit Mikola's Halig tree. We see a statue of a one-armed woman mm -hmm. yeah, embracing we there. a child, Mikola. In this place, we see the biggest example Ugh. of Mikola's benevolence, the Halig tree, and the society that was built into the brace that supports it. This was a promised land, seen as a salvation to many who were shunned or persecuted, provided that they can actually find the path here, of course. And like Fed many other his Empyreans, Mikola seems to have had the will within them to create a new order. And his is an order that's somewhat modelled on the ones that came before it. The biggest thing is that the Halig tree is clearly inspired by the Erd tree. But the difference is that Mikola's Halig tree is said to be accepting of all, even those the Erd tree shuns. It frames it so much differently if you consider that there was a tree before the Erd tree. So then it's not like every other tree attempt is just cribbing on that. But like it could actually be an attempt to return to what was before, mm. you know, before the, the conspiracy and the fraudulence. It's, it's, yeah, it, it, it changes around like the growing of this Halig tree that ended up failing. Um, because it's like, you, you can say that, yeah, maybe it was going for what came before as opposed to what currently is. Mikla himself was once embedded inside of the Halig tree and he watered it with his very own blood since it was a mere sapling. Tragically, however, he was ripped out of this womb during the shattering and his Halig tree ultimately failed to grow into an Erd tree, becoming a misshapen husk instead. But that's the story for another day. There's also a ton of cut content to do with Mikola, and he's one of the most mysterious really? demigods, who I'm sure we'll learn about more later. Uh. But there is one more thing that I want to mention before I go. It's kind of one theory I had during the making of this video. So Mikola and Millennia each have their own butterflies. Millennia's is the Aeonian butterfly, which inhabit the swamp of Aeonia, and are rumored to come from the wings of the rot goddess herself. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fair to say that Mikola's butterfly is the nascent butterfly, which appears as if it's just emerged from its cocoon for its entire life. This is a reference to Mikola's eternal youth oh, shit. and his cocoon in yeah. the Helig tree. But there is, of course, a third butterfly, right? There's the smoldering butterfly. It's said to be an eternally burning butterfly that serves as kindling. 
Now bear with me, but it's my theory that this butterfly is a reference to Melina, who the Blade of Calling calls the Kindling Maiden and the one who walks alongside flame. This might suggest that Melina is a sibling to Melania and Mikola. Again, that's just a theory, but what I really want to talk about here is that, at the very least, Melina is almost certainly the daughter of Marika. We learned this a long time ago from looking at her name in the game's files, and we can further infer it from her dialogue. Motherfucker. File names. <laughs> I, can't, I can't argue with that. Uh, it would certainly make her, the, the, the rhyme and reason behind Melena and Melenia work a little bit better. Uh, what the fuck does it say down there? God damn it, what was that source text? Let me get that thing in the meantime. I mean, it only lasts like 10 minutes, right? Good. We're okay. All right. What, is, what did it say? What did it say? Almost certainly the daughter of Marika. We learned this a long time ago from looking at her name in the game's files, and we can further infer in, it from in Marika of daughter? Her dialogue, as she has a few lines that files, and we can further infer it Ma from Marika her, from of daughter. At her yeah. name in the game's files, and we can further infer it from her dialogue, as she has a few lines that refer to mothers and one that says that she was born inside the Erd tree. So, her being the daughter of Marika is also just a theory, but this one is much more concrete than the butterfly one. Yeah. Although the reason I like the butterfly theory is that it gives us a hint as to who Melina's parents might have been. Her parents would have been Radigan and Marika. Which is to say, Marika herself alone, I guess, because Radigan is Marika. Yeah. Honestly, Melina as a character has only become more mysterious since the game was released, and I'm really only scratching the surface with this theory. Uh, but speaking of times before Elden Ring was released, back then, a long time ago, I commissioned this piece from a renowned artist named Marco. And yeah, that's now that's I'm so totally to reveal it for uh, the first time. plausible. This storybook scene um, is heavily inspired by the early looks we had at Elden Ring, with considering the shit like considering shit like Millicent as well. A mount is also that looks like, like Yakul and a bit like uh, Torrent and anyway. a few other hidden details in the piece. Mm. This piece and all of my other prints are now available over at Spring, where you can actually buy them fully framed and ready to hang. Is they there ship with a Is there any line when we introduce um beautiful oh, I guess frame, it's much the frame right. itself One second. is a nice black satin finish and you can even opt for a white border around the print which I think looks really classy okay. in certain cases all to right. actually if you're interested. Yeah, support Support. Support is good. Um, wow. <laughs> okay. We are just about hitting our, our, our time limits. So let me just uh, very quickly keep an eye on this. Yeah, we got a... We got a... <laughs> we're fucking... Yeah. Um, Melina. Elden Ring. Let me just go to her dialogue What's real on your mind? quick. Uh, when she talks about being your stand-in maiden, just want to see. Um, summon me to turn your grace runes into strength. Use the steed. Treat him with respect. Summon me my, my grace. Um, yeah, she doesn't. She doesn't say a ton outside of, here we go. Uh, I'm searching for my purpose given to me by my mother inside the earth tree long ago. Well, that is fucking that. Mother inside the earth tree? Who the fuck else is that? So hard, con hard confirm on that line. <laughs> done and done. Just, I'm like, yeah, just go back to that first thing she said. Yeah. Okay. I never had that. You ate that peanut butter sandwich. Just shut up. It's, you know what's in there. <laughs> Oh wow! Fingers all jammed up. <laughs> uh, searching for my purpose, given to me by my mother inside the earth tree long ago, for the reason that I yet live, burned and bodiless. There is something for which I must apologize. The act I've acted the finger maiden, yet I can offer no guidance. I am no maiden. My purpose was lost long ago. So straight up, and that's also why she can channel her fucking mother when you go to the churches. Because yeah. it's mom. Ma said that. 
So she's literally, yeah. Mama said, knock you out. That underlines exactly what that is. Um, she is no maiden. She's another one of them. Her, the name, the reason why her name is so similar is because she's one of those kids as well. I don't know. It doesn't necessarily confirm direct. Ma's, yeah. And her butterfly is what she ends up doing, which is immolating at the first flame, uh, fell first flame at the kiln, you know, well, whatever the shot forge of the giants, but dark souls, we know what that is. Um, yeah, the butterfly thing is pretty solid. That's pretty solid. Um, Damn. That's crazy. He don't miss. Okay. Yeah, she, yeah. So we, we she did talk about her mom in the beginning and that was just like a very easily mm-hmm. missable thing. Okay. Um, if we start this one right now. And don't stop. And don't stop. We we'll, can do it. We can do it. All right, let's go. Y'all are ready? Here we go. The lore of Elden Ring's Bingo. bosses. After death, what is the right way to die? You. Can death be overcome? And if it can, what are the consequences of such a thing? These questions are at the very heart of Elden Ring's story, and in order to answer them, I want to go over a set of bosses that are defined by their relationship to death, those being the death birds, the ancestral spirits, the tibia mariners, the godskins, the burial watchdogs, and the black knife assassins. Understanding these bosses will teach you so much. It's true. In Elden Ring, One's self is separated into two distinct entities. There's the body, which is one's physical self or corporeal flesh, and then there's the spirit, spirit, which is essentially the soul that commonly persists after death. In the age of the Erd Tree, the bodies of the dead and their spirits are returned to the Erd Tree. This is done via a process called Erd Tree Burial, where great tree roots in catacomb dungeons absorb the dead so that they might be immortalized with the Erd Tree. But it was not always this way. In fact, the entire culture of death had a different shape in the earlier days of the Lands Between. Back then, instead of Erd Tree burial, death commonly burned in Ghost Flame. Ghost Flame, also known as Spirit Flame, is a cold white flame that is created when bones are burned to ash. Double names? We learn this from the fallen horse. Different methods of death handling. Rivers. When the last Tibia Mariner, of their torches were used up. Out of place. They don't have a job anymore. Bird Tree yeah. took the job. The cold ghost flame. There you go. This process appears to help separate the spirit from the body. And while a lot of these spirits appear to be vengeful based on the ghost flame spells, I think in general, having the body separated from the spirit in this way would have been a desired outcome. I speculate that we see proof of this even in the current age, where the wandering dead at Agil yeah, Lake Erdtree gaze at the derbs. sky, praying that the dragon Absolutely. Agil might burn them to ash. Perhaps this was simply the acceptable way to put a tired body to rest. They want it to burn. The keepers of Ghost Flame were the Death Birds, who tended to the flame in their graveyards, raking out the ashen remains of the dead oh, the from their kilns. So I like to think of the Death Birds as serving the old process of death and delivering death by reducing bodies to ash so that spirits might be better able to move on. Now, admittedly, a lot of these spirits are vengeful, and that's how Ghost Flame is sort of weaponized oh. by the Death Birds. You saw that. You saw that. You saw that Hollow Brand, right? right? What the? At its you core, saw the Hollow Brand. Ghost Flame was important just because it separated the body and the spirit. After all, the explosive Ghost, Ghost Flame, Flame sorcery compares this process of death to the Erd Tree's process of death, which was pretty all-encompassing, so I think it's safe to assume that Ghost Flame was just really important to the process of death, and it was more than just, you know, vengeful spirits. God, now it makes so much sense why there's different kinds of death. Next, we should talk about the Twin Bird, which was the mother of the Death Birds. We don't find this creature in-game, but we can find its likeness painted vividly upon a kite shield that one of the Death Birds drops. The design might remind you of Did the he call phoenix, it what? which is traditionally and drawn in the with game, bright colors Albert and a crest of feathers and a longish neck. Of course, the phoenix is a creature that rises from the ash when and it dies. Envoy of an Albert God. Is what? The death bird. The twin bird. The twin bird. Story. Mother of so death birds. The kite birds. shield tells okay. us that the twin bird, or this phoenix creature, is said to be the mother of the death birds. But not only that, it's also called the envoy of an outer god. 
So we can kind of compare More the twin outside to tampering. the two fingers, then, who are also envoys to an outer god. They are envoys to the greater will. Is the greater will an outer god? Similarly, I assume the twin bird... I thought the greater will was the one inner god. ...outer god of death. And while we're definitely left wondering what greater purpose this outer god might have, the mere fact that it exists lends a lot of significance to the twin bird and its death birds as well. A variation on the death oh, bird I thought is all the death other gods right beyond bird, the greater will are outer gods. An boss, and, and America is just like a, also a god, but it actually in seems to use power okay. that it's gained from certain spirits and ghost flame. And if you look really closely at its ethereal wings, you might even spy little spirits lurking Whoa. within. And when I saw cool. these, I was really excited because I recognized the weapon they're using, and the weapon explains who they are. Um, they're holding a little death ritual spear, and that item reads, The priests became the guardians of the birds through the rite of death, which is a part of their contract Sick. for a far-off resurrection. So death birds have a lot to do with sacrificial rites. You know, they don't just attend to the ghost flame, they also deliver death, and they also perform rites of death. So we can assume that these priests were sacrificed in a rite of death so that they could lend a sort of spiritual strength to the death birds. Oh yeah, that was a death that was a bird head. Wondering about the on top of that axe. Their contract you saw the, the beak? death birds which promises a far off resurrection for them. Spiritual strength to oh, okay. them. The bird opening in its a mouth. Rite of yeah. death. This is a far off resurrection for them. You know, what agreement did these priests come to with the death birds? I wonder what has to happen for their contract to be fulfilled and how will they even be resurrected? In terms of where the death birds appear, they kind of appear everywhere. And I think that might be a hint that their influence was once present far and wide. And while their importance in the current age is likely quite diminished, they still definitely are relevant in the lands between. In fact, many other enemies actually make reference to them, and some even successfully channel their powers. Even Ghost Flame lights the way in catacomb dungeons to this day. But in general, there is a lot of power that can be the gained headless? from death in the lands between. Which brings us to the ancestors. Yeah, there was spirit. a link in the description. Mm. In the flourishing landscapes underneath the lands between, you would have found the bodies of three large stags enshrined by the ancestral followers. These warriors, hunters, and shamans believe heavily in the principle that life sprouts from birth, but also from death. I think this principle is sort of represented by horns, because in real life, horns continue to grow throughout the lifespans of animals, with their primary function usually being to convey a social hierarchy. And here, the largest and most influential creature is a giant stag. And in the world of Elden Ring, since life continues after death, it makes sense then that this creature's antlers continue to bud and grow even after its death. We learn this from defeating the regal ancestor spirit and looking at the horn of this fallen king. New growth spud, glowing with light. Thus does new life grow from death, and from death one obtains power. Long-lived beasts like this are worshipped by the ancestral followers, a race of beings who keep their distance from the Erd tree and are just content to await new buds and new growth. If a being does not show signs of budding horns or new growth, then they are sacrificed with an axe called the Winged Great Horn. Interestingly, the twin blades of this sacrificial axe are called Envoy's Wings, which might be a reference to the twin bird we mentioned earlier, which was also a winged envoy. According to the horn mm. charm talismans, the ancestral spirits specifically Doubt. arise mm. from long-lived beasts, and I think this touches on another commonly repeated theme in Elden Ring, which is that there are benefits to living life to its fullest potential. Um, to quote some more Deathbird items, the most glorious end awaits those who cling tenaciously to life, and it is important to render up a death worth offering. Those who lived a heroic life were even able to go on and see a unique version of grace in the afterlife. We currently think that this grace is red, and that these are the same red rays of grace that you might have noticed when you first explored the Forbidden Lands. So this might be the most intriguing part of the video. Let me explain. Past the Forbidden Lands, and deep within the consecrated snowfields, is a tibia mariner. And this one drops Helfen Steeple, mm -hmm. a great sword that reveals just a mind-blowing amount of lore mm -hmm. for one item. 
First, it reads, Greatsword patterned after the black steeple of the Helfen, the lampwood which guides the dead of the spirit world. So the word steeple is commonly used to describe the tall spire found on churches, and indeed, the design of Helfen steeple echoes that of the Morion blade from Dark Souls, which also referenced the spire of a church. However, while I think Helfen is likely to be a sort of church, I don't think it's a building. Instead, this item seems to be describing the shape of a black tree in the spirit world, a so-called lampwood or lamplight tree that serves as a guidepost for the heroic dead. The item goes on to say that lamplight is similar to grace in appearance, and it is said that it can only be seen by heroic spirits or those who met their death in battle. So the black tree of Helfen is almost like this dark mirror of the Erd tree, but in the spirit world. It's so interesting that it even gives off its own guidance of grace, and there's a few reasons we speculate that this grace might be red. First, a red gem can be found at the very tip of Helfen's steeple, and a gem on the rolled medallion as well. Plus, there's a red glow visible from the sword's gem, and a red glow from the rolled medallion when you hold it up at the Grand Lift, where it takes you to the Forbidden Lands, where we speculate that you can briefly glimpse this lamplight or red grace filtering between the trees. So you might be asking, why can we see the grace when we're not dead? Heroic but spirit. technically tarnished are defined as the dead who yet live, so it might make some sense oh, that we okay. can see it. The next question is, where does the lamplight lead? Just be badass enough. I think there's two options. One is that the lamplight might lead back to Helfen itself. Uh, that is the source of the light after all, and Helfen's steeple can be enwreathed in ghost flames, so maybe the dead are sort of put to rest here. Alternatively though, I guess it's also possible that the lamplight has plans for the heroic dead, just like Grace has plans for the tarnished. It might lead them somewhere else as well. We just don't know. In my discussions with Quelag, who helped with these hey! theories, she pointed out the similarities that <laughs> Elfin has with Valhalla of Nordic folklore. Um, if you don't know, Valhalla is a place where mm -hmm. brave spirits would we'll die be invited battle. to dine with the gods. And it seems that Helfen is inspired by that same sort of folklore, since only heroic spirits can see the light. Not to mention Hel, with one L, is actually the name of the world of the dead in Nordic folklore. And speaking of folklore, this finally brings us back to the Tibia Mariner, the boss that dropped Helfen's steeple in the first place. The Tibia Mariners themselves actually have no written law to speak of, which is kind of a shame, but what they do have is an incredible visual design, and it kind of carries them from a lore perspective, because this visual design is steeped very heavily in appropriate folklore. So, in Greek mythology, there is a stretch of water called the River Styx, mm -hmm. which marks the boundary between Earth and the Underworld. And to help souls of the deceased cross this river, you have to find the river boatman yeah. and pay him to safely take you across. Just so, I kind of imagine the dead in Elden Ring are being drawn to the Tibia Mariner in a similar fashion. It's the shape so of the boat, too. He has a purple lantern and a loud horn, yep. and he might offer a similar sort of guidance to the underworld. There is one spell that references this boss briefly. It's Tibia's summons, and it says, For time immemorial, the dead have been those who are lost and require guidance and leadership. Suffice to say, death was a very important facet of life in the lands between. But there were multiple kinds the of death, one too. Point. Which brings us to the godskins, working the order in of apostles that were born to deliver destined tandem. deaths to the gods long ago. I kind of like to think of them as a counterbalancing force to the influence of gods, wielding sharp tools for boring and slicing through flesh, and incanting spells that mocked the wrath of the gods. It seems these godskins actually succeeded in hunting many gods, if their name is to be believed. Their robes were made by sewing together patches of smooth skin, and the nobles' robes include subcutaneous fat, which makes them plump and soft. Known for their seven-faced aprons, these nobles are the most ancient apostles, and they're deeply inhuman. Their weapon is not a slicer, but a stitcher, and they wield it with a skill that is unmatched <laughs> by any lowborn. Oh yeah. These beings were elevated to a social class above the lowborn because they served a queen, a glow-mide queen. The black flames they wield are actually channeled from that queen's greatsword, and it was this queen who raised them from birth in the first place, cradling her newborn apostles in godskin cloth 
so that they might grow to become the death of the gods. This Glomide eyed queen was powerful, but what makes her character so important is that she was also an Empyrean, chosen by the fingers. Now, remember, an Empyrean is a candidate chosen by the two fingers to become a god. So, despite being such a dark character, the Glomide Queen was still a valid choice for godhood. If a Numen and can just this, become a real god. Before the Rune of Death had been removed from the Elden Ring, and it was from this Rune of Death that the Black Flame originally got its power. We only know of one other Empyrean alive at this time, and that would have been Queen Marika. Naturally, at some point, Marika and the Glomide Queen clashed. Though, according to the Godslayer Greatsword description, we know that the Glomide Queen was defeated by Malekith, who was the shadow of Queen Marika. He is credited with defeating the Glomide Queen and the Apostles, and sealing off the Rune of Death, which again was the source of their power. What's not clear to me about all of this though is whether Marika and the Glomide Queen were rival Empyreans competing for godhood, or if Marika was already a god and decided to take out the Glomide Queen. The amount of dead gods the they're wearing was an almost imply more dead age. gods than living but ones. At any rate, it seems like Do you know Marika what I mean? and the Glomide Queen hanging are out, opposites. waiting you know, as soon as the two the fingers or something goes, you're a god, and they just start cut, sharpening the tools eternal. outside. So it makes sense that they'd clash. There's still so much we don't know about them. But after all of this, Marika's Age of the Erd Tree began, and during this age, you were supposed to wait for the roots of the Erd Tree to call to you, so that your spirit could return to the Erd Tree after death to be immortalized with it. Specifically, these roots were found in catacomb dungeons, and there's even a statue found across the lands between that was designed to help people find these catacomb dungeons. This is the statue of Rosus, the Usher of Death, oh. and he shows the dead the path towards catacomb dungeons. The catacombs okay. themselves were built in the Age of the Erd Tree. This is proven by Root Resin, which states that the roots here were once linked to the Erd Tree, and it was for this reason that catacombs were constructed around these great tree roots. So at this point in history, Queen Marika had implemented her new concept for death in the lands between, and in her eyes, a proper death meant returning to the Erd Tree. Thus, in the days where catacomb roots were connected to the Erd Tree, these catacombs were valid sites of Erd Tree burial. And I think we literally see this taking place as corpses can be seen mm -hmm. being absorbed by the roots. Every the single of every one of those catacombs, catacombs yeah. The process of Erd Tree burial, though, is God. described as an honor reserved for heroes. The fucking content. And this process of Re Erd Tree repetition burial dungeons have more implications Tree burial that makes sense. Who protect the catacombs? Okay, with from soft. Servants. Well played. These creatures are golems. Chalice and dungeons I have think a reason. That they might have been created <laughs> specifically the spirits. during the period of history where Leonia had an allegiance with Lane Dell, since they served yeah. the process of Erd Tree burial. But you their need them like grave have glintstone. Uh, like graveyards. Them. Furthermore, when hit by impure crystal darts, they malfunction, which I think is further proof of their glintstone origins. In some catacombs and graveyards, the physical bodies of the dead have begun to rise. Now, these beings are defined as those who live in death, and they are a relatively recent phenomenon in the lands between. Instead of having their body and spirit return to the Erd Tree, they rise in an act that is completely at odds with Marika's concept of death, Erd Tree Burial, and the Golden Order. I'll go into more detail on this later when we talk about Godwin, but basically, this all began when Rani stole a fragment of the Rune of Death from Malekith, and then she imparted its power onto the knives of the Black Knife Assassins. You can tell the assassins have quite a lot of secrets in their lore. Uh, we do know a few things though, we know that they're all women, they're all Newman, and they have links to Queen Marika mm -hmm. and the Eternal City as well. We'll have to go into more detail on them later though. But with their knives imbued with the Rune of Death, they carved a curse mark into two demigods, Rani and Godwin. The curse mark itself is an obtainable item, and it reads, This curse mark was carved at the moment of death of the first demigod, and should have taken the shape of a circle. However, two demigods perished at the same time, breaking the curse. Do you mark have into to do that to kill wheels. them? Is that part Rani of the, 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 first the death of the process? Whose flesh perished, mm, while the prince of death but perished in like, soul. Is it not life. enough to just so stab the god to death? You have to then, and the knives imbued you know, with the rune of death had the power to cleave 
receive life from the physical body and from the spirit as well. Specifically, Rani was the one whose flesh perished and she became a disembodied spirit, free from her corporeal flesh, which is what she wanted, and she now occupies a doll. But Godwin became the prince of death, living without a soul and spreading the rune of death across the lands between through death. Why didn't that happen now, to Rani? According to item descriptions, death root is the rune of death itself, and it acts as a source that gives rise to those who live in death. Now, what I find really interesting is the fact that this rune of death that is embodied by death root and those who live in death, it clearly has aspects of both death and life as well, which makes sense based on what you should have learned from this episode, right? Because death isn't just the end, it's life as well. So it makes sense that those who live in death would have aspects of death and life, all contained in these beings that were brought to life in a sense by the rune of death. Ah, shit, I know we don't have the ability to do this, but... Soul and spread one whose flesh perished and viewed with the rune of death as well. Specifically, Rani was the one whose flesh perished. Flesh perished. She became a disembodied spirit. Yes. Free from her corporeal flesh, right. which is what she wanted, and she now occupies a doll. But Godwin became the prince of death, living without a soul and spreading the rune of death. Death root is the rune of death itself, and it acts as a source that gives rise to those who live in death. Now, what I find really interesting is the fact that this rune of death that is embodied by death root and those who live in death, it clearly has aspects of both death and life as well, which makes sense based on what you should have learned from this episode, right? Because death isn't just the end, it's life as well. So it makes sense that those who live in death would have aspects of death and life all contained in these beings that were brought to life in a sense by the rune of death. And while those who live in death are a bit unnatural because they do come from this fragmented rune of death, this half of a curse mark, they still have life in death. Okay, and each so half. You can argue that they still one have half a targets right the body, to one half targets the soul. And in fact, that's yeah. entirely yeah. Okay. what one of the endings is about, yeah. at least how I understand it. And I'll try to explore it more thoroughly later on. These beings are persecuted and hunted down by fundamentalists of the Golden Order. And whether these fundamentalists are truly serving the fundamentals of order in the first place is just a topic that is very interesting to explore. Well, so, in conclusion, <laughs> maybe it shouldn't be a sin to live in death. After all, to quote Fia, in death there is only peace, for in death there can be no sensation. Thank you for watching. Special thanks to Quayla for looking over this script. She has an awesome channel that you really should go and check out, and it's been great to have someone to just discuss my ideas with. But I'd also like to thank Eve, the sponsor of this video, yes. who'd like me to talk about Spectrum, Absolutely. which is their high-end gaming monitor. Support, now, support I Vati's of the sponsorship ads that come and my way, sponsorships. Go, go help them out. It's a super uh, good channel that is worthy of your... Support, hashtag ad, hashtag shill, hashtag sponsor. Completely agreed. Absolutely. Okay, well, I don't know about you, but I see. I understand. That explains everything. Doesn't get it at all. <laughs> <laughs> I have no questions. I now understand all of it. Uh, that's fucking great. I'm so happy with the shit that we got really close to and the shit that we landed on as well. Um, really, really cool. I especially really like the uh, the idea of death that has death being out of a job in various forms. And it's like, no, 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 we still have to die. But now the Erd Tree death is what makes this order all a matter. And of course, the things that are the biggest questions are remain unanswered. DLC is going to come and give us a whole bunch of those things. Oh, but boy. for now, for now... We will have to be sated with that, and that's all right by me. Yeah. This is one of the biggest, most intense, insane, definitive video game experiences I've ever had, bar none. Um, thanks for sitting along with it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching, everybody. And... Uh, Holy shit, give us a minute before we pop in another Souls game. <laughs> Let it breathe. See you next year. See you next year. <laughs>
That was awesome. Uh, shit. <laughs>